now, the greatest radio shows of all time. Suspense. The Shadow Node. Washington calling David Harding, counter spy. Classic radio theater. The Great Gildersleeve. Faber McGee and Molly. Dragnet. Gunsmoke. The Lone Ranger. Now, step back into our time machine with your host, Wyatt Cox. Good evening, friends of the Inner Sanctum. A variety this Monday, probably leaning toward the comic, but it will have a lot of music and some drama and all of that this hour. Uh, With uh, Edgar Bergen, Charlie McCarthy, Fred Allen and Town Hall tonight, Bing Crosby and the Philco Radio Time, and of course we'll hear from Lum and Abner on this Monday, 22nd day of January, 22nd day of the year of course, 344 days remaining until we get to 2025. Columbia Photograph Company formed in Washington, D.C. on this date in 1889. In 1890, the United Mine Workers of America founded in Columbus, Ohio. In 1917, President Woodrow Wilson called for peace without victory in Europe in World War I. In 1946, creation of the Central Intelligence Group, the forerunner of the CIA. 1947, KTLA, the first commercial television station west of the Mississippi River, began operations in Hollywood. 1952, the first jet liner, the de Havilland Comet, entered service for British Overseas Airways Corporation. 1957, the New York City mad bomber George P. Medeski arrested in Waterbury, Connecticut, charged with planting more than 30 bombs. 1962, the Organization of American States suspended Cuba's membership. 1968, Apollo 5 lifted off, carrying the first lunar module into space. In 1968, Rowan and Martin's Laugh-In premiered on NBC, beginning a a four-and-a-half-year run that premiered some great entertainers. Sock it to me, sock it to me, sock it to me, sock it to me, sock it to me. And now, folks, it's sock it to me time. Very interesting, but stupid. Rowan and Martin's Laugh-In, of course, they're Judy Karn and Artie Johnson. But so many great comics, Gary Owens, Ruth Buzzy, uh, Henry Gibson, Goldie Hawn, uh, Joanne Worley, Alan Seuss, Lily Tomlin, Dennis Allen, and Richard Dawson. So many people and so much fun. A wonderful series. Rowan and Martin's Laughing, premiering on this date back in 1968, replacing The Man from Uncle. In 1973, the Supreme Court delivered its decision in Roe v. Wade allowing abortion. It's very hard to believe that the men on the Supreme Court could have this much of a sense of what is really happening in abortion. You know, it's, it's, I mean, so many of the things that uh, the government or the legislature or even departments of health do is so unrelated to the practice of abortion. And this is so specifically related to the practice of abortion that 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 blows my mind how many millions of children prior to their birth will never live to see the light of day because of the shocking action of the majority of the united states supreme court today now the decision uh, allowed universal abortions nationwide the decision reversed in june of 2022 uh, turning regulation of abortions back to the states 1984, the Apple Macintosh, the first consumer computer to popularize the computer mouse and the graphical user interface, was introduced during Super Bowl 18 with its famous 1984 television commercial. Today we celebrate the first glorious anniversary of the information purification directives. We have created for the first time in all history a garden of pure ideology where each worker may bloom secure from the pests of being contradictory reports. Our communication of the rules is more powerful a weapon than any fleet or army on earth. We are one people with one will, one resolve, one cause. Our enemies shall talk themselves to death and we will fight them with their own on january 24th apple computer will introduce macintosh and you'll see why 1984 won't be like 1984 
The uh, commercial was directed by fame director Ridley Scott, who now has won a couple of primetime Emmy Awards and other great accolades. Uh, English athlete Anya Major performed as the unnamed heroine, David Graham, as Big Brother. It only aired twice on American television. First in 10 local outlets, including Twin Falls, Idaho, uh, where they ran the ad on December 31st as 1983, at the last possible break before midnight so that the advertisement qualified for 1983 advertising awards. Its second televised airing and only national airing was on January 22nd, 1984. Uh, that was on this date during a break in the third quarter of the telecast of Super Bowl 18 by CBS. In one interpretation of the commercial, 1984 used the unnamed heroine to represent the coming of the Macintosh, indicated by her white tank top with a stylized uh, line drawing of Apple Macintosh's computer on it as a means of saving humanity from conformity, Big Brother. These images an allusion to George Orwell's noted novel 1984, which described a dystopian future ruled by a televised Big Brother. Now, the estate of Orwell and the television rights holder of the novel 1984 considered the commercial to be a copyright infringement and said a cease and desist to Apple and the ad agency Shiat Day in April of that year, but by then it was too late. The awards were being made, and Macintosh was on the road to success for at least a period of time. 1987, a Pennsylvania politician R. Bud Dwyer shot and killed himself at a press conference on live national television, leading to debates on boundaries in journalism. Well, you know, when you're covering something live, it's very hard to have control over what people do. And uh, Mr. Dwyer was uh, obviously disturbed you can't hold that out against uh, the television stations. In uh, 1989, Super Bowl 23 in Miami saw San Francisco beat Cincinnati. The last play, the 49ers hope for Cincinnati's offense. Four wide receivers to the far side. Asias and back to throw. He steps up. He throws as far as he can. And the uh, jump for the ball. And it's, I don't know whether it's caught or it's not caught. It is not caught. And the 49ers have won the Super Bowl. Joe Buck with the call on CBS television on this date in 1989. Robert Tappan Morris Jr. convicted on this date in 1990 of releasing the 1988 Internet Computer Worm. In 1991, three Scud missiles, one Patriot missile, hit Israel, injuring 96 people back in 1991 in the Gulf War. Three elderly people died of heart attacks. In 1992, Dr. Roberta Bondar became the first Canadian woman in space during a space shuttle mission that launched on this date. And in 2002, Kmart became the largest retailer in U.S. history to file for Chapter 11 bankruptcy protection. No, Kmart is not going out of business. In fact, uh, this is going to help Kmart actually expedite its turnaround plan and be stronger, more profitable, and ultimately more competitive in the marketplace. Chairman Chuck Conaway, 300 stores closed, 34,000 employees laid off. The company would be restructured and buy Sears. In 2003, the last successful contact with the spacecraft Pioneer 10, one of the most distant man-made objects. In 2010, Conan O'Brien ended his brief tenure as host of The Tonight Show after accepting a $45 million buyout from NBC to leave the show after only seven months. And I believe to this date that Conan O'Brien was shafted. He did not get a fair chance at The Tonight Show. Now, passing away on this date in history, Alan Hale Sr., the uh, father of the skipper, the man called X, Herbert Marshall, President Lyndon Johnson passing away on this date. The man we know as Titus Moody on Allen's Alley, Parker Fennelly, Kojak, Telly Savalas passing away on this date. Pro wrestler uh, Jerry Blackwell, the matriarch of the Kennedy family, Rose Fitzgerald Kennedy, cartoonist Bill Maudlin, known, known most for his uh, World War II cartoons. The man who did a lot of the music for Stan Freeberg, Billy May, also uh, actress, dancer Ann Miller, Watergate scandal figure Rosemary Woods. She was the lady who, uh, uh, did she erase the tapes? 
I'm trying to remember. I My memories of that are not as good as they used to be. Uh, actor Heath Ledger and baseball legend Hank Aaron passing away on this date. Folks who were born on this date in history but who are no longer with us include philosopher Sir Francis Bacon, Douglas Wrongway Corrigan, film director D.W. Griffith, actress Ann Southern, also Sam Cooke, You Send Me, actress Piper Laurie, who passed away last year at the age of 91, actor Bill Bixby, and English actor John Hurt, all born on this date in history. Hi, this is Jeff Foxworthy. It is now time for the birthday announcements. The following people are now officially older than dirt. Galloping along, Graham Kerr, the Galloping Gourmet, 90 years old today. Author Joseph Wamba, 87. Lead singer of Journey for so many years, Steve Perry is 75 years old. Pro wrestler Tully Blanchard, who uh, he even worked as late as a couple of years ago in All Elite Wrestling. He now does some work on the independent circuit, and he's got a daughter named Tessa, who is very uh very good tully blanchard 70 years old today jack lemon's boy chris lemon 70 years old today actress linda blair from the exorcist 65 today g dj jazzy jeff 59 guy fieri is 56 and still making people fat like me uh, from the Drew Carey Show and NCIS, Matt Eisman, 53. From Suits, Gabriel Macht is 52. From Malcolm in the Middle, Christopher Masterson is 44. From Seventh Heaven, Beverly Mitchell is 43. Singer, now interior designer, Willa Ford, 43. And from As the World Turns and Jesse, Isabella Palmieri is 26. Those just a few of the people celebrating the 22nd day of December is, of January, I should say, is their birthday. Uh, if this happens to be your birthday... Hi, we're the four freshmen, and we just want to say... Happy birthday to you! And on a variety day here on Classic Radio Theater with Wyatt Cox, we'll get started with comedy and uh, other stuff. Uh, the new Edgar Bergen Hour with Charlie McCarthy, uh, 68 years ago, January 22nd, 1956. That's next here on Classic Radio Theater with Wyatt Cox on this Monday. Civil defense is common sense. Hi, this is Tony Bennett. Make sure you're prepared if nuclear attack ever comes. Yeah, be prepared. Now on Classic Radio Theater with Wyatt Cox, uh, we go back some 68 years to January 22nd, 1956 for an episode of the new Edgar Bergen Hour with Charlie McCarthy. And the first half of the show gets underway in just, well, just about now. From Hollywood, it's the new Edgar Bergen Hour with Charlie McCarthy. <laughs> If you there can sell me, I'll mull you down. It's Sunday night, and time again transcribed for Edgar Bergen and Charlie McCarthy with Mortimer Snurd, Effie Klinker, Rudy Whistler, Carol Richards, Ray Noble, Jack Kirkwood, the Mellow Men, yours truly, John Heaston, and our special guest, safety supervisor, Mr. Cecil Zahn. <laughs> And here they are now, the stars of our show, Edgar Bergen and Charlie McCarthy. Oh, oh alas, alackaday, my heart is heavy as a blintz. Grace Kelly could have had me, but instead she picked a prince. <laughs> How are you tonight, Charlie? My old friend, my old buddy. Are you talking to me, Bergen? Yes, that's right, my dear chum. Dear chum. Bergen, has somebody been spiking your wheat germ? No. <laughs> Slipped a Mickey in your yogurt? No, no, not at all, old pal. Old pal, you know, this is getting a little sickening. Yeah. <laughs> all right, what did you do, Bergen? What do you want? Oh, nothing at all. It's just that I consider myself very fortunate in being able to call you friend. Yeah? Yes. Well, I'll go along with that, but I'm suspicious here. I feel that in having you as a pal, 
I am the richer for it. Yes, uh uh-huh. Well, now, how about raising my allowance and let us all get in on this thing, then? (laughs) No, I don't know how I can impress you about this, Charlie, but I consider myself lucky to know you. Yeah. Boy, you you really must be in a mess, Bergen. (laughs) Now, come on. What have you done? Well, Charlie, I did go to see my doctor yesterday. Oh. Oh. You need blood. No, no, no. (laughs) He needs blood? No, no. The nurse needs blood. No, no. 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 The doctor just found that I've been putting on a little too much weight lately. Oh. Have you happened to notice my stomach lately? Notice it? It's been pushing me out in the audience. Oh. (laughs) Some people have a little pot. Yes. But you got a whole stove. No. (laughs) Anyway, the doctor recommended exercise. Yeah? Yes. I thought it'd be a very good idea if I had the use of a bicycle, you know, for exercising. Yeah? You know, someone, you know, like you, you have a bicycle, don't you? Uh, You do understand. Yes, yes, I do, yes. You're going to... You're going to buy a bicycle? Well, I thought maybe I wouldn't have to resort to buying one. Oh? We might figure another way out of it, Charlie, old friend. Yeah? Yes. Another way out, huh? Yes. I see. You forgive me for being so stupid. Uh, you, you want me to steal a bicycle for you? No. <laughs> no, it's not that either exactly, Charlie. Well, I guess I'm... I'm just not as smart as you are, Bergen. I I don't get it. Well, you have a bicycle, don't you? Yes, yes, I do. That's right. I have a bicycle. And it's mine. Yes, yes, I know. <laughs> but you don't you don't use the bicycle a great deal now, do you, Charlie? That is not a great deal. Well, I I I just ride it to school every day and ride it home, that's all. I just pump and sweat up and down those hills all day. <laughs> Every day, that's all. I see. All I want was the use of your bicycle. Yeah, well, you ain't gonna have it. Oh, I see. Yeah. I hope that's not being blunt. Yeah. Well, you wouldn't do that to an old friend, would you? I sure would, stranger. Oh, I see. <laughs> <laughs> but my pal, my Charlie Warley. Now, don't Charlie Warley me. Look, Fatsy Latsy. Yeah. <laughs> You're making me sicky wicky. All right. Oh, how you do, chaps? Pip, uh, pip, cheerio, and all those various British salutations. Yeah. <laughs> I'm getting sickier and wickier. Yeah. All right. <laughs> no, but I say, chaps, uh, what's the dispute? Well, there isn't really any dispute, uh, Ray. It's just that my doctor wants me to take off weight, so he recommended a bicycle. My word. What an unusual diet. Well, it is. <laughs> no, no, no. You don't understand what well, I... I should say not, no. old boy. I mean, you must have a beastly time chewing on those tires. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> you got it all wrong. You see, blubber hips here is supposed to ride on a bike. Yeah. Oh. Blubber hips, ah, oh, that's the very idea. I haven't put on that much weight. You haven't, huh? No. Well, then how come I saw a tourist pointing at you and say, Look, Mabel, there's Mount Baldy. No. <laughs> <laughs> I say, you know, a friend of mine had a large stomach, oh. and yes, and he took to riding a bicycle every day. Oh, and and he got, and that got rid of his stomach. Oh yes, that's all behind him now. <laughs> <laughs> I see. Well, Charlie, I'm still waiting for your answer. Now look, Bergen, if I lent you my bike. Would you object to a small service charge? No. <laughs> are you going to loan me the, uh, the, your bicycle, or aren't you? Well, let me, let me, uh, I'll tell you what, how we work this out. I'll let you have it tomorrow, Bergen. But tonight, I'm taking my girl for a little ride on the handlebars. Oh, you are? <laughs> yeah, a little ride, I see. Well, Charlie, you can't stop, you know, in Lover's Lane and pull that old line that you're out of gas with a bicycle. No, <laughs> but I could always say that I'm, I'm too poop to pedal. I see. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, last week our talented and lovely songstress Carol Richards thrilled us with little mistakes from her new hit, Victor Record. In fact, all of us here on the show liked it so much, we were curious as to what number was on the flip side of the record. So, always anxious to oblige, here is Carol Richards singing, Look at Them.
look at them walking so lovingly arm in arm. Look at them caught in the spell of each other's charm. And look at me, I'm so bewildered and lonely. Once I was his one and only. Just as she is now. Look at her, smarter than I was in every way. Ladies and gentlemen, we present Professor Kirkwood's Do-It-Yourself Department. Ow! <laughs> Thank you. You're in very good voice tonight, Professor. And now here he is, the man who was born a genius, but outgrew it the first day. <laughs> <laughs> Professor Thomas Alva Kirkwood. <laughs> Thank you, thank you, thank you. I'm sorry for being late, but I was very busy. You see, this is my olive picking season. Oh, you pick olives. That's right, boy. Out of martinis. <laughs> oh, that's nice. I like it. <laughs> Tell us, Professor, what is the subject for today? Well, my talk today is for those millions of you who are violating the anti-noise law. Oh, just how are they violating it, Professor? By snoring. Oh. Sometimes called sheet music. (laughs) (laughs) Snoring. (laughs) Sheet music. Oh, that we should have stayed in bed. Uh, Professor, just what do you intend to do about snoring, then? I'm offering the public my do-it-yourself snore cure kit. Well, how does it work? Oh, very simple. You see, most snoring is caused from breathing in and out. Yeah. Well, my snore cure kit teaches you how to breathe sideways. <laughs> that is all in the breathing. Yes, that's right. I see. If we didn't breathe, we wouldn't snore. But then everybody's got to breathe. Oh, howdy, chaps. Of course, there's always an exception to the rule. <laughs> 
Look, I, I say, old Professor Chap, uh, just exactly what causes snoring anyway? Yes. Your uh, epiglottis. Oh, no. It always happens when your epi gets too big for your glottis. <laughs> yes, I see. You do? Yes. Then suppose you explain it to me. <laughs> Anyway, I can guarantee that in no time at all, I can cure anybody's snoring. How? With my patented snorkill tube. Oh, no. Get it, snorkill tube? Snorkill. <laughs> well, I said it, and I'm glad. Uh, but we aren't, oh, Professor. Yeah. That one belongs underwater. <laughs> <laughs> Professor, I think you'd better get on, though. Yes, it's time for a little commercial on my snore cure kit. Oh, yes. <clears throat> Folks, when you sleep, do you sound like an elephant trying to digest a couple of bricks? Yeah. <laughs> Is your snore so noisy they can hear it in Boise? <laughs> do you all sleep Western style with those great wide open faces? <laughs> <laughs> night after night, do you break through the sound barrier? <laughs> Are you a nocturnal blowhard? <laughs> <laughs> if you'll excuse me... When you sleep, does your breath come in long drawers? Oh, uh... <laughs> does your night breathing sound like the mating call of a lovesick ferry boat? <laughs> if it does, then buy my snore cure kit and you'll finally be able to say, Ah, there's good snooze tonight. <laughs> <laughs> I say, Professor, you know, uh, perhaps you can help me with my snoring. Well, I'd be glad to. Uh -huh. but first, let's get some information. Do you always snore? Not at all, old boy. Only when I'm asleep. Yes, oh, well. <laughs> <laughs> yes, but Anyway, the first thing in learning to quit snoring is learning to hold your breath. Yes, but how long should I hold my breath? Yeah. Well, hold it for 30 days. If nobody calls for it, it's yours. <laughs> <laughs> yes, but look here. That might kill me. Yeah. <laughs> Professor, to get back to the topic, have you ever cured anybody? Why, certainly, boy. Huh? I cured my wife snoring, and you should have heard her every night. She was the inspiration for the cry of the wild goose. <laughs> Why, she even made cement mixers jealous. And you cured her. Yes, that's right. Yeah. I bought a big dog, and every time she'd snore and whistle, it would jump on her bed and wake her up. <laughs> that's pretty clever of you. Yes. <laughs> Except for one thing, the dog snored. Oh. <laughs> uh, well, problems do arise, don't they? Yeah. Yes, they do. Yeah. <laughs> but in my kit, I have a guaranteed sleep producer. Mm. It's my own special brand of Kirkwood sleeping pills. Mm -hmm. They come in four sizes. Catnap. Beauty rest, deep slumber, and what are you doing next New Year's Eve? You have them that strong. Oh, yes, but don't worry. Your money is refunded if you don't wake up. Oh, uh, all right. <laughs> you know, Professor Psychiatrists say that to get to sleep, a man should never take his daytime problems to bed with him. You mean his wife's got to sleep somewhere else? <laughs> Oh, I'll buy that. <laughs> you know, I hear that some experts also recommend hypnosis as an aid to sleep. No? Oh, yes. Mm -hmm. I had one fellow who couldn't sleep, so I used hypnosis on him. Yeah. I just looked him in the eye and said, Abracadabra, go to sleep. Yeah. Abracadabra, go to sleep. And did it work? Well, his abracadabra went to sleep, but the rest of them stayed up all night. <laughs> Well, our time is up. Yeah. <laughs> but before we go, Professor, don't you think some old-fashioned advice is really the best? Oh, you're so right, yes. boy. Every night, just take a couple of old-fashioned and you really sleep tight. <laughs> <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, on our last program, we introduced a young man whom we felt had a great singing future ahead of him. And from the mail we've received, it seems that many of you in our audience agreed with us. So here he is, back with us once again, Rudy Whistler. Thank you very much. What are you going to sing for us tonight, Rudy? I'm going to live till I die. Very sage advice. I'm gonna live 
till I die. I'm gonna laugh instead of cry. I'm gonna take the town and turn it upside down. I'm gonna live, live until I die. They're gonna say, what a guy. I'm gonna play for the sky. Ain't gonna miss a thing. I'm gonna have my fling. I'm gonna live, live until I die. The blues will lay low. I'll make them stay low. They'll never trail over my head. I'll be a devil till I'm an angel. But until then, hallelujah, gonna dance. I'm gonna fly, take a chance, ride high. Before my number's up, I'm gonna fill my cup. I'm gonna live, live, live until I die. I'm gonna live until I die. I'm gonna laugh instead of cry. I'm gonna take the town and turn it upside down. I'm gonna live until I die. They're gonna say, hmm, what a guy. I'm gonna play for the sky. Ain't gonna miss a thing. I'm gonna have my fling. I'm gonna live, live, live until I die. The blues will lay low. I'll make them stay low. They'll never trail over my head. I'll be a devil till I'm an angel. But until then, hallelujah, gonna dance. I'm gonna fly, take my chance, riding high. Before my number's up, I'm gonna fill my cup. I'm gonna live, 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 live until I See a dream walking. Well, it ain't me. <laughs> Good grief, Mortimer. Just look at those bruises on your face and head. Why, you look positively atrocious. <laughs> yeah, well, thanks, Sue. Uh, <laughs> you look pretty good yourself, Mr. Burton. Uh, your poor head and those bumps there. Well, my, 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 my. You're in some pretty bad condition. Yeah, well, well. You don't think they'll have to amputate it, do you? No, no. No, I don't think they'll have to remove your head. Well, I hope not. I kind of need it as a place to keep my hat, you know. Yeah. <laughs> what happened? Were you kicked by a mule? No, no, it wasn't that. I see. Fell off a bar? No, no, no. Asked me if I was hit by a truck. All right. Were you hit by a truck? No, I wasn't. <laughs> well, now, how did it happen? Well, I'll tell you, it was like this, uh, you see, Charlie got me to go into one of them there, uh, uh, you know, wrestling matches. Wrestling matches, yeah. And, uh, and uh, he covered my face and I was uh, known as the masked uh, moron. The masked moron. Yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah, uh-huh. You can make a lot of money if you stay in the ring, you know. I see, yeah. Mortimer, didn't you know what Charlie was getting you into? I don't know. No, I guess not. What kind of a fool are you? Oh, my kind, I guess. <laughs> Char- Charlie said, Charlie said that wrestling was easy. Oh, you're so gullible. Well, yeah. Oh, is that what it is? Yeah, it is. <laughs> I'm gullible. <laughs> I'm gullible. Yeah. I don't know what it means that I'm gullible. Yeah, yeah. Well, I'll tell you. If Charlie told you black was white, you would believe him. Well, yes. Well, ain't it? No, no. <laughs> I don't know. I haven't traveled very much, I know. Hey, well, now, who, who was your wrestling match with? A uh, fellow called Gruesome Gus. Gruesome Gus, yeah. The Pomona Pulverizer. Pom- <laughs> I see. Well, isn't he the wrestler who agrees to pay $25 to anyone who could stay in the ring with him 10 minutes? Yeah, yeah, that's the fellow, yeah. Boy, them 10 minutes, they sure flew, Yeah. <laughs> And so did I, most of the time. Yeah. So you went into the ring with this bruiser and you actually exchanged blows with him? Well, not exactly that. I 
Just kept the ones I got. I <laughs> he said he, he he said he'd pin my ears back. Weren't you scared? No, I thought maybe they'd look better that way. I... <laughs> So you started mixing? Yeah, we we started mixing. Next thing I knew, I had a turned up nose. (laughs) Turned up nose, yeah, turned up behind my ear. Oh, I... (laughs) Made it pretty hard for smelling, though. Yeah. (laughs) Well, uh, tell me then what happened. Uh, Well, I don't know. Uh, Long about that time, I, I looked up and I saw a face that I recognized in the third row. Is that so? Yeah. A face you recognized. Who was it? It was me. Oh, you... <laughs> and still you didn't give up. Well, all I can say is, stout fella. Well, thanks. Uh, you're getting a little bulgy yourself. <laughs> no, I mean, I'm proud that you stood up to him like that. In other words, I'm glad to see that you've got red blood in your veins. Well, he didn't leave very much of it there. <laughs> Let's face it, he clobbered me. Uh-huh. It was really bad. Yeah, I'll say it was. Finally, he got so rough with me that my mask came off. Oh, your mask came off. Yeah. <laughs> then what happened? Well, he, he got one look at my face and he fainted. <laughs> Gruesome Gus fainted. Yeah, yeah. Well, yeah, that's no getting away from it. I got a face that only a nearsighted mother could love. I'm <laughs> Then it looks as if you won after all. Yeah, I did, yeah. My, my. Well, that shows, shows you that you can't, you just can't keep a good man down. No. You, do you know who said that? Well, it must have been some cannibal with indigestion. No, no. <laughs> well, anyway, this gruesome Gus, he was out cold. <laughs> that means that you won the $25. Yeah, and you know what? Charlie gave me $3 of it. <laughs> you mean you only got $3 and Charlie got the rest of it? Yeah. Well, that's the way it goes, you know. Yeah. Charlie made a fool of you. Well, I don't give him all the credit for it. <laughs> I done my share too, you know. Yeah, you certainly <laughs> did. The Edgar Bergen Hour, transcribed with Charlie McCarthy, Mortimer Snurd, Rudy Whistler, Carol Richards, Jack Kirkwood, the Mellow Men, and Ray Noble, will be back after station identification. And that's the first half of the new Edgar Bergen Hour with Charlie McCarthy from 68 years ago today, January 22nd, 1956. We'll get on with the show and more of it, but first, these important messages on this Monday edition of Classic Radio Theater with Wyatt Cox. Civil defense is common sense. This is Fred McMurray. Home shelters can be built for as little as $100. Simple plans for building inexpensive home shelters are available free from your civil defense office. Ask for a copy of the Family Fallout Shelter booklet. Classic Radio Theater with Wyatt Cox continues now with the second half of the new Edgar Bergen Hour with Charlie McCarthy, 68 years ago today, January 22nd, 1956. From Hollywood, it's the new Edgar Bergen Hour with Charlie McCarthy, Mortimer Snurd, Rudy Whistler, Carol Richards, Jack Kirkwood, the Mellow Men, Ray Noble, and yours truly, John Heaston. Now, ladies and gentlemen, let's follow along as lovely Carol Richards strolls down memory lane with Moments to Remember. The New Year's Eve We did the town The day we tore the goalposts down We will have these moments To remember Well, Ma... Here we are, married 50 years now. That's right, Pa. (laughs) 50 years? Yeah. How about getting out our old scrapbook so we can reminisce a bit? That's a good idea, Tui Ma. (laughs) (laughs) Oh, Oh, never mind, Pa. Don't get up. I'll go and get it. 
know, Pa, I love to go through our scrapbook. <laughs> Look, here's a picture of you as a baby lying on a bearskin rug. <laughs> Just look after you don't have a hair on your head. <laughs> uh, you're holding the book upside down. <laughs> Oh, Paul, you're a caution. Look at this page. Here's a picture of us kissing on our first date. Oh, yes, sir. We really lived. Yeah, but not lately, though, but we've lived. (laughs) Oh, you're right, Paul. We still have some lovely memories. Yes. (laughs) Yes, we've had some wonderful moments to remember. Hello, Mater. Hello, Peter. I'm home from school. I'm home. Pa, it's our son, Edgar. (laughs) I knew there was something I was trying to forget. (laughs) Though summer turns to winter and the present disappears, the laughter we were glad to share will echo through the Other days will find us gone a separate way. We will have these moments to Now, ladies and gentlemen, for our Meet the People department, tonight's guest is a man who is making an important contribution to highway safety. He has helped inaugurate driver education courses in our high schools and is a present supervisor of safety for the Los Angeles City Schools. I'd like you all to meet Cecil Zahn. Good evening. Well, Cecil, we're very happy to welcome you as our guest tonight. Anyone whose job helps train young people to drive safely certainly has our support. Thank you, Edgar. I recall a remark the well-known movie stuntman, this uh, Yakima Knut once made, or Knut, I believe was the name. Uh, He said, for a living, I drive burning wagons over precipices and jump from trains and galloping horses. But you couldn't pay me to tangle in that traffic around Hollywood High when, when school's letting out. He says, I'm a stunt man, not a fool. <laughs> Yakima was probably right a few years ago, Edgar, but he'd be quite surprised at the improvement he'd see if he went around that same school today. The driving habits of boys and girls have certainly improved. I suppose you attribute a great change for the better to the popular driver education course now being taught in the high school. Yes, I do. We still have a long ways to go, but... I contribute to driver education and its companion course of practice driving or driver training course. Oh, I thought they were one and the same. No, not quite. This driver education is a classroom course, Edgar, which uh, is required as a graduation requirement in all of the high schools in the state of California, while driver training is actually a behind-the-wheel program. It's an elective. Mm -hmm. And during the weeks of combined instruction, those youngsters learn a great deal about safe and sane driving. Well, exactly what do they learn, Cecil? First, the uh, youngsters learn the ABCs of good driving. They learn the meaning of attitude while driving. Quite a bit about the vehicle code, which I'm sure the us oldsters never had an opportunity to learn. They also learn uh, something about the economical use of a car. Well, after they learn the theory, do they actually get behind the wheel? Yes, good many of them do. From there, they drive a school-owned dual-control car... They drive it over a prescribed course with a trained instructor. They learn how to pass other vehicles, turn and back up. We even teach them how to park. (laughs) I didn't think high school kids had to be taught how to park. Uh... (laughs) What about freeway and turnpike driving? 
Well, we take them right out on the freeway after they've had some preliminary training. We don't get them out there uh, right off of the bat by a long ways, but uh, before we finish with them, as many as we can, after all, that's probably going to be the first place they head for anyhow, and we think that our training will teach them good freeway driving habits and techniques. Bob Hope once gave a very good description of a freeway. He said a freeway was a place where you could drive for 16 miles without leaving the scene of an accident. (laughs) Well, sometimes we think that that's uh, the way it is, but it's really not that bad, uh, Edgar. Uh, Our police department has uh, come up with some pretty good figures on the causes of accidents, and we in the schools in turn pass the information on to our young people as we receive it. And on the freeways, for instance, uh, following too closely and improper lane changing are at the top of accident causes. Now, what is considered a safe distance to stay behind another car on the freeway? One car length for each 10 miles an hour of speed. Uh, This means if you're traveling 55 miles an hour, you should be five and a half car lengths behind the car ahead of you for safe traveling distance. And five other eager beavers would scramble in ahead of you. (laughs) Why do drivers tend to drive near the center-wide line? Well, this would probably prove that they had not taken our high school courses in driving, Edgar. Uh, (laughs) We uh, we teach them there to judge the distances, which I think is uh, one of the reasons that people get over the left-hand side where they can see the line. Uh, They just uh, haven't learned to judge the distance on the right. Uh, How many young people in California take driver education and driver training each year? Well, there's about 100,000 10th graders take it, uh, the classroom driver education each year in the state. And this year in the city of Los Angeles alone, 25,000 of them will take the classroom course. And about 8,000 of this 25,000 will receive the the behind-the-wheel training. Well, this is an expensive training course, then, isn't it? Well, it does cost us about $44 to train each one of them. However, $30 of this is reimbursed to the school district by the state of California. Well, pretty cheap insurance for a generation of safe drivers. Taxpayers shouldn't object to that, then. No, I'm sure they don't, Edgar, especially uh, when they realize that the money comes from the violators of traffic regulations. Now, if you uh, got a traffic citation recently, Edgar, and uh, wondered why you had to pay $11 instead of 10 There's a reason for it. That extra dollar was a penalty assessment for the state general fund, and it found its way back into our driver training program. Oh, then I'm sort of helping a boy through driving school. (laughs) (laughs) What about the parents who want to give children driving training themselves? Well, I'd like to evade that one, but that's one of the reasons for our course, Ed. Your fatalities on our highways kept mounting, and so did our insurance rates when we relied upon parents to teach their children to drive. Mm-hmm. It seems that parents uh, pass along their own bad driving habits. Well, then what, what's good enough for dad isn't necessarily good enough for the sons and daughters. Tell me, Cecil, in these courses, do you talk only about driving a car? No. We uh, talk about bicycle safety quite a bit. We talk an awful lot of about pedestrian safety. Oh, that's right. There are pedestrians. That's right. <laughs> Well, uh, we discuss such things. When does a pedestrian have the right of way over a motorist? Well, I'd say when he's in an ambulance. (laughs) (laughs) Oh, well. Edgar, I think you better sign up for our course. Yeah, me. (laughs) I'd like to, but I don't think I could get back into high school. Well, Cecil, it sounds from what you've told us that the overall picture for the future generation is a much safer driving record. Yes, it does. And the other day when I was out at Hollywood High School, Instructor John Abbott uh, had a motto printed on his blackboard that I think we could all profit by. What was that? He just had the simple words, the best driving rule is the golden rule. Well, I don't think we could improve on that. Thank you very much for being our guest tonight, Cecil Zahn. Good night, Edgar. Good night. Now, ladies and gentlemen, here are the Mellow Men, who have just completed a slimming down course at Slenderella, so they can fit into their dungarees. <laughs> you know the reason why? Yes, it's a dungaree doll. Dungaree doll, dungaree doll, paint your initials on my jeans, so everyone in town will know we go around together, together, together. Dungaree doll, dungaree doll, 
paste my picture on your sleeve so everyone can see that you belong to me forever, forever, forever. I want you to wear my orange sweater, the beat up sweater with the high school letter. Gonna make a chain of paper clips and chain us together while I kiss your lips. Dungaree doll, dungaree doll, promise me you never will fall for any other guy. Tell me you are my dungaree, 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 dungaree doll. Make your initials on my jeans So the whole darn town knows we're going round Together, together Dungaree doll, dungaree doll Paste my picture on your sleeve So everyone can see that you belong to me Forever, forever I want you to wear my orange sweater, the beat up sweater with the high school letter. Gonna make a chain of paper clips and chain us together while I kiss your lips. Dungaree doll, dungaree doll, promise me you never will fall for any other guy. Tell me you are my dungaree, 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 dungaree doll, dungaree doll. If you've got a cold, but you've got a job to do, too, listen. Take Super Anahist, the modern medicine that helps you feel better, look better, work better when you can't stay in bed with a cold. Feel better. Super Anahist relieves fever, headache, muscular pain. Look better. Super Anahist relieves sniffles, red watery eyes, sneezing. Work better. Super Anahist relieves that dragged out feeling, helps you resist after effects. Only Super Anahist does this with its five cold-fighting wonder drugs now prescribed by doctors. So when you can't stay in bed with a cold, feel better, look better, work better. Take Super Anahist with concentrated vitamin C, regular and children-sized tablets. Super Anahist. Head cold miseries, stopped up nose. Melt away mucus, relieve congestion with new Super Anahist antibiotic nasal spray. The only nasal spray with a germ-killing antibiotic plus mucus-melting fonzide. Open up stopped up nose, breathe again fast. Get Super Anahist antibiotic nasal spray. Carol, Carol Richard. What is it, Charlie? Right now, I was wondering if you'd help me make my annual movie awards. Oh, do you give out something yes. like the Oscars for the best pictures of the year? Yeah, well, no, these awards are for the worst pictures. <laughs> <laughs> I give out egg cups. Egg cups? <laughs> they lay them, and we give them something to put in them. <laughs> well, you know, it sounds very interesting. Yeah, well, here we go. We now present... The McCarthy Cavalcade of Flops. These pictures were so bad, the critics reviewed the popcorn. <laughs> These movies were shown only in theaters equipped with that new process, Cinema Magna Stereo Vita Optoscope, which means no screen at all at all. <laughs> we wait until a fat lady walks in and flash it on her back. <laughs> And now we present... <laughs> our first Egg Cup Award. This was the year of political exposés, such as the Miami story, the Houston story, and the Phoenix City story. Those were the successful ones. We want to present the one that failed. The Skunk City story. <laughs> that was a stinker. <laughs> This is the story of Tax Anything McCarthy, a barefoot boy who became the richest political boss in the state. Our scene opens in the penthouse of an exclusive hotel in the state capitol. As McCarthy is moving in, he makes a brief inspection and angrily storms to the phone. Yeah, hello, manager. Yes, sir. Hey, this is Tax Anything McCarthy. Yes, sir. Send up four chambermaids. My fiancée's. She's decided to take a milk shower. Milk shower? Yeah. But why does she need four chambermaids? Somebody, I say somebody, has to hold up the cow. <laughs> Get on the ball, son. She is society. 
Who's there? It's your fiancé, Pamela. Oh, come in. La 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 la. <laughs> Sometimes I think I'm buying her too much jewelry. <laughs> I just love a cultured tomato. <laughs> How vulgar. Yeah. Tax anything, remember. You're marrying into one of the oldest families in the blue book. Yeah. Are you going to boast about how high class your parents are again? Please, please. Yeah. I was so aristocratic. I had no parents. Like <laughs> <laughs> say. Then how were you born? I was ordered from Saks Fifth Avenue. <laughs> I think I'll open up a charge account there. I like the merchandise and the wrapping ain't bad either. Uh, how about a little lunch, Toots? Eh? Oh, that would be divine. Okay. Let me summon my butler. You rang, sir? Mm. <laughs> yeah, we'd like a hunk of lunch. What do you have, Pamela? Oh, perhaps some Romanoff caviar and, uh, and let's, oh yes, some frog's legs. Frog's legs? Mm. Look, I'm rich. Bring her the whole frog. <laughs> <laughs> yes, sir. Very good, sir. Yes. I'll hop to it. <laughs> oh. <laughs> Do you get it, sir? No, frog, hop to it, you see? Yeah. <laughs> I say that was a pip, wasn't it? Yeah. <laughs> I think someday I'll kill him. I don't know. <laughs> Another pip like that and I'll pop you. I tell you, I will. Yeah. Oh, wait, say, sir, and, and, and speaking of pop, uh, yeah. should I serve you some champagne? Oh, what year? Oh, this year? You seem to be in a hurry. <laughs> <laughs> and I'll answer the door. I'm expecting my assistant. Hello, tax anything? Hello, collect anything? Man, did you figure out any new taxes? Oh, yes, Chief. I got the best one of all. We're going to put a tax on holes. Holes? No one will be able to make a donut without paying us. <laughs> Why, we'll be rich from Swiss cheese alone. That's the boy. Good work there, I'll tell you. Now, you keep that up, Kirkwood, and we'll drive people to their graves. Well, we're charging them for those holes, too. <laughs> Here are the reports, Chief. Yeah, the reports, eh? Yeah. <laughs> These figures, they don't match, Kirkwood. Oh, you hurt me, boy. Uh, you gotta trust me. You've got to think of me as your mother. Well, all right. <laughs> Wait a minute. Why have you got your hand in my wallet? Don't you remember? You didn't buy me anything for Mother's Day. Oh. <laughs> you double crossed me for the last time, Kirkwood. I'm pushing you out the window. Oh, no, no. No! No! You rang, sir? <laughs> no, I pushed. <laughs> Nobody double across his knee. Just a second, McCarthy. You won't get away with this. Pamela, my society flower. I'm not a society girl. I'm a reporter from the Daily Globe. And now I have enough proof to expose you. No. <laughs> Stop the picture. What happened? The fat lady just walked out for some popcorn. <laughs> Got no scream. <laughs> and now for our second egg <laughs> I didn't think that hen would make it. <laughs> this was the year of great Western dramas like Fred McMurray's At Gunpoint. But there was also the other kind, the psychological Western. Some were good and some were bad. And then there was... Tumbling, tumbleweed, tumbling down the old tumbleweed trail underneath the tumbleweed moon. <laughs> or... Becky Thatcher goes east. Oh! Home and deranged Where the fears and the neuroses play Where a seldom is a heard An intelligent word Cause what can a psychopath say? <laughs> this is the psychological drama of a cowboy Whose mind is shattered by the conflict of emotions Rising out of the heat and dust of the pitiless prairie I'm, I'm a crazy cowboy I'm real crazy 
my mind was shattered by the conflict of emotions rising out of the heat and the dust of the pitiless prairie. I'll never forget the day it all started. I was riding into town. Hey, cowboy, you're riding your horse backwards. Oh, how do you like that? I thought he was round-shouldered. <laughs> That's when I knew my nerves were cracking. I walked into the bar and I called for the bartender. You rang, sir? I was really cracking. I didn't even know what movie I was in. Cowboy, you want a drink? Yeah, I'm tough. Give me a glass of milk. I thought you said you were tough. Well, all right, put it in a dirty glass. I don't know. <laughs> What's the matter with me? I'd never ordered milk before. I staggered out of the bar with a homogenized hangover. <laughs> and then she rode up. Howdy, cowboy. And who are you? I'm Becky Thatcher, and uh, I'm a-going west. She was riding her horse backwards, too. <laughs> Boy, there's something wrong with you. Yeah. You're in bad shape. Yeah. I'm a taking you to a Western type psychiatrist. Howdy, folks. I'm a Western type psychiatrist. <laughs> this is a quickie. We can't waste any time. And you're a psychiatrist? Yep. My name is Hopalong Freud. Oh. <laughs> well, tell me, Doc. <laughs> tell me, Doc. Why are you bent over that away? I carry my own couch. <laughs> well, tell me about your childhood and uh, color it up a bit. I hate a dull story. <laughs> oh, yeah, please, boy. please, please, please. I tell you, I'm going crazy. Well, make it quick. I got a serious case in the next room. The fellow thinks he's a taxi cab. Well, uh, well, Doc, are you trying to help him? Heck no. It's better than taking the buzz. <laughs> ridiculous, a man thinking he's a taxi cab. <laughs> oh, 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 I forgot. I left his meter running. Okay, Sam, I'm coming. <laughs> and now for our third Egg Cup Award. <laughs> that was a double feature. <laughs> We've either got to get smaller eggs or bigger hens. I don't know. He's having trouble back there. This year, there were so many jungle pictures filmed in Africa, all the animals were getting agents. It was a difficult choice, but here it is. We now present the worst jungle picture of the year, entitled... Or... A safari beats its way into the impenetrable African jungle in search of the fabulous golden goddess. As they come to a crocodile-infested stream, their leader starts across. Lead the way, Explorer McCarthy. Okay, Explorer Kirkwood. Here I go. Oh! A crocodile just got me by the toe. <laughs> well, don't worry if you get bit, boy. I got this bottle of crocodile cure with me. Uh, it's 90% alcohol. What, what's the other ten percent? Who cares? Don't, <laughs> don't, don't forget, you only take that stuff for crocodile bites. Oh, you know? yeah. Here, crocodile. Here, crocodile. <laughs> oh, I lose a lot of toes, but I have a lot of fun. <laughs> you know, Kirkwood, I think we're getting close to the golden goddess. I better call the native guide. His guide? Uh, Wonga Bunga Mingo Gambo? Now, what does that mean? You rang, sir? Oh. <laughs> I'll throw that well, fellow to the crocodiles. Father. There you are. What happened? <laughs> they threw him back. <laughs> Onward, safari. Listen, those jungle drums. Quick, guide noble, what are the drums saying? How should I know? I'm a piano player. Oh, <laughs> I understand those drums. It's that cannibal disc jockey, Peter Potful. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> no, he's... He's 
got a request for the number one song on the Cannibal Hit Parade. Tennessee Ernie singing 16 Tums. Yeah, must be something wrong with the missionary he bought at the company store. <laughs> It's the golden goddess. Oh, thank goodness you're here. But we'd better hurry. The elephants are stampeding. Look out. There goes a big bull elephant. Stop the picture. Why? That's no elephant. That's the fat lady going out of the aisle. She's going over. <laughs> You know, folks, you can always put extra faith in a product when its manufacturer has a famous reputation to uphold. And believe me, nobody cares more about their reputation than the makers of CBS TV sets. Right, John? Right indeed, Edgar. CBS TV sets are made by a division of the Columbia Broadcasting System, a name that's been famous for great home entertainment for over 25 years. Naturally... The CBS people want you to receive TV programs in your home just as perfectly as they're sent from the studios. And that's why CBS TV sets are built the costlier way, with oversized screens, brighter picture tubes, cascode turret tuners, and many other luxury features. Yet amazingly, you can own a beautiful 21-inch CBS TV set for as little as $169.95. No doubt about it. The new CBS TV sets in both 21 and giant 24-inch models are the first luxury sets in the popular price field. So make your next set a better set. Make it a CBS. And now here is Edgar Bergen. It's time for another bit of sage advice from our rural philosopher, Mortimer. And here he is with Snurd's words for the birds. <laughs> A person who sits down on a sharp tack is much better off. (laughs) (laughs) Thank you, Mortimer. And until next Sunday, good night, everyone. Remember to listen to Edgar Bergen with Charlie McCarthy, Mortimer Stern, Ray Noble, and the entire ensemble next Sunday at the same time. Tonight's Edgar Bergen Show with Jack Kirkwood, Carol Richards, Rudy Whistler, and the Mellow Men was produced and transcribed in Hollywood by Sam Pierce. Script by Cy Rose, Hilda Black, and Zeno Clinker. Incidentally, if you're listening to us in your car, take it easy and drive carefully. Take a tip from the truck drivers. They know the rules and they drive by them. This is John Heaston speaking. Sixty-eight years ago, January 22nd, 1956, the new Edgar Bergen Hour with Charlie McCarthy. We're going to step back now 88 years to January 22nd, 1936 for an episode of Fred Allen's first big vehicle, Town Hall Tonight. That's coming up next here on Classic Radio Theater with Wyatt Cox on this Monday. Civil defense is common sense. This is Howard Duff with this reminder. 640 and 1240. These are the Connell Rad frequencies during a national emergency. 640 and 1240 on your regular radio will be your only official means of receiving vital information. Remember, 640 and 1240. By the way, some have been asked about the flyers that are get mentioned in some of these civil defense uh, um, mentions, um, civil defense uh, messages we have here. Uh, a lot of those are available at civildefensemuseum.com. That's civildefensemuseum.com. We have a link in our description that you can follow and find out more. Now, let's find out more about what was going on 88 years ago today here on Classic Radio Theater with Wyatt Cox. January 22nd, 1936, the man who had the long-running feud with Jack Benny, and it was Fred Allen and Town Hall Tonight. <laughs> in Town Hall tonight, folks. 60 minutes of fun and music brought to you by Ipana Toothpaste and Salapatica. 
Ipana for the smile of beauty, Salapatica for the smile of health. Fun with our star comedian Fred Allen and his mighty Allen art players. Music with Peter Van Steeden, the Ipana troubadours, and the town hall quartet. And another group of anxious and eager amateurs. New voices, new music, new fun. It's town hall tonight! <laughs> Crowd. They're jumping up and down and cheering as Fred Allen leads his weekly parade at the old town hall. Fred's driving in the wind as the band lowers the boom boom. And the mighty Allen art players are dancing a community horn pipe as the people cheer. Let's join the merry throng. Everybody join. Here they come. Parson. Well, come on, Parson. Quit stalling. We're here to get married. Relax, young man. Your nuptials will have to wait for an hour. It's town hall tonight. <laughs> Politician. You say you favor cutting down all radio allotments, Senator? Except the 60 minutes allotted to one radio program. It's town hall tonight. Lost Explorers. What were your first words when you got back to civilization, Mr. Ellsworth? I said it's Wednesday, boys. Bring me a radio. It's town hall tonight. <laughs> Here we are at the old town hall, folks, and there's Fred telling the crowd about the wonders on the inside. Listen. You don't need your top hat, folks. You don't need your white tie. And even the dogs don't have to worry about their tails at the town hall. Everybody's welcome, so step right along. Evening you... there, old fuss budget. Good evening, Mrs. Berry. How's the village dressmaker tonight? Well, I'm still looking on the seedy side of life, Mr. Allen. Go right in, Mrs. Berry, you old so-and-so. The fun is fast, the music's right. It'll take you 60 minutes, folks. It's town hall tonight. Hey there, Ellen. Hi, Luther. Say, it's a little late in the season for that Palm Beach suit, isn't it? They say you've got the hottest show in town, Ellen, and I'm dressed for the occasion. <laughs> all right in, folks. Sing the line, please. Hurry, hurry, hey, hurry. Hey, we're hurry. all set here, Fred. How about you? Okay, Harry. Tell Peter we'll open with I Feel a Song coming on. Right, old Fred. Let her go, Peter. <laughs> that tempestuous titan of tintinabular titillation and tit-for-tat terminology, Fred Allen in person. Woo. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, and good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Now, before we ask you to put your hands on the Ouija board and help us to get Joe Miller so that we'll be sure of some mid-Victorian jokes for this evening, I'll read you the town hall bulletin for tonight. Hodge White, public grocer number one, says that for the next few days, customers coming into the store will have to wait on themselves. Hodge sent his pants out to the tailor Monday, and the tailor shop caught fire. And Hodge won't be able to come out from behind the counter now until the insurance company covers his loss. <laughs> Hodge says he may be on the half shell, but business will go on as usual. So much for sar <laughs> sartorial dilemmas in the vicinity, and now for the town hall news. And now, Harry... See, uh, I'm way ahead of you, Fred. Here's really? your picture sheet. Thank you. Do you remember what happened a week ago tonight in New York City, NY, Harry? Oh, yes. The lights went out, didn't they? I can take a hint. Here they go. The projector starts, and we bring you the latest news of the week. The town hall news sees nothing, shows all. Williamstown, Massachusetts. Williams College installs neuropsychiatrist to solve undergraduate problems and enable students to attain full benefits of college life. Town Hall News shows how new service will probably work out. The scene, the psychiatrist's office at Williams College. There's a student waiting, doctor. Here's his charge. Mm-hmm. 
Buster Trundle, sophomore, scholarship poor. He may be down in the classroom, but in a rumble seat. Oh, doctor. Ah, you, uh, you seem to know quite a lot about the patient, nurse. I ought to. He's taken me out a couple of times when I had the money. He's always borrowing. Yeah, it's probably a case of claustrophobia. You said it, doctor. He's close, all right. This is no time for levity, nurse. I'm here to see that the Williams undergraduate attains full value from his college life. Show the patient in. Yes, doctor. Right this way, Mr. Trundle. Thanks, nurse. And now, young man... Uh, Doc, I had to come here. I know, Buster. You're not getting everything from your college life. Well, no. Your ego is no doubt undergoing a delicate period, with the inferiority complex struggling for recognition. Well... Exactly. Freud says, neurosis are red, violence is blue. Uh, do you ever see red and then blue? Well, I... I... knew it. Psychology teaches us that uh, students are porous mentally. Now, look here, You're Doc. You're perfectly right, Trundle. Wearing an imitation raccoon coat can give you the mentality of a ferret. The scientific term is uh, ferritinitis. Uh, but listen, Doc. Take off that rigor mortis, man. Speak up. You're holding something back. Well, yes, Doc, I am. You're not attaining the full value of your college life. You're stifling your subconscious. You need something. Well, I, I hate to ask you, Doc. As your college psychiatrist, I demand that you ask me. Well... Speak freely, Trundle. What is it you need? I need two dollars to get my tuxedo out of hock, Doc. How about it? Burlington, Ontario. Chief Constable L.B. Smith offers to protect single men from annoyance during leap year and threatens to arrest brazen women who bother bachelors with marriage proposals during 1936. Town Hall News shows how men will probably be protected during leap year at Burlington, Ontario. The scene, the side street, time, 8 p.m. Well, hello there, Bismuth. I ain't seen you since New Year's. No, I've been hiding indoors since January 1st, Rankin. Oh, what's the big idea? Oh, it's leap year, Rankin. Ha! <laughs> That's right. You single guys have got to keep out of sight. Oh, you bet. A bachelor in the next house was hit over the head the other night, and he woke up in Niagara Falls. <laughs> yeah, it's pretty dangerous, all right. Yeah, I just come out at night to get a little air. If I hear a woman coming, I jump right back into the house. <laughs> well, I gotta be getting along. So long, Bismuth. Uh, so long, Rankin. Oh, you fast. <laughs> <laughs> Who's that? Who's there? Who's... No, no, don't get frightened, mister. You you don't know me, hussy. No, but I've been watching you sneak out every <laughs> night. I've been waiting to catch you alone. Now, see here. Now, take your arms away. Take If, if you're here with intent to flirt... It says leap year, Daddy, and you're hooked. Oh, yes? Well, 23 for you. <laughs> if you're playing fast and loose... <laughs> Kissing me. I mean business, honey. This is a proposal. A proposal? Help! Police! A proposal! Help! A hey, proposal. hey, hey, what's going on here? This woman's annoying me. Oh, yeah? What's your racket, sister? It's sleep year, ain't it? She's been molesting me for half an hour, officer. I'm crazy about him, copper. Never mind him. You're coming with me. Here's the wagon. Are you engaged, officer? No. Well, get in the wagon and you will be. Help! Please! <laughs> Tacoma, Washington. Three Tacoma medical organizations put medicine on big business basis. Patients contract for medical attention in advance, guaranteeing monthly payments for operations or other medical service they may require. Town Hall News gets opinions on new system. Simeon Spavin, prominent veterinarian, says... Us horse doctors can't sign up our patients. We got to trust to luck. I've been horsed out of plenty. The only time I ever got my money, I treated a racehorse for tonsillitis. That horse paid... Twenty to one. <laughs> Town Hall News shows how contracts for medical attention may work out for average family. The scene, home of Walpole Brink, a white collar worker. Hello, dear. You're late, Walpole. Yes, dear. The five twelve was snowbound. Well, supper will be ready in just a minute. I'm starved. Hey, what's new? Any visitors today? The finance man was here about the car. I stalled him. Well, that car's been stolen us ever since we got it. <laughs> now we're even. The collectors for the washing machine, the refrigerator called, too. Those guys with their easy payments. I'll show them how easy they are. And the doctor's been here twice. Your appendix payment is overdue. <laughs> that croaker insisted on taking out my appendix. Now he can hold the bag. Oh, that's probably the doctor now. now. Let him in. I'm ready for him. Good evening, Mrs. Brink. Oh, come in, Doc. Step in, Max. Okay, Doc. This is my lawyer, Mr. Corpus. How are you, Mr. Corpus? I object. 
Something tells me... Something tells me this ain't no social call, Doc. What's on your mind? You're way behind with your appendix payments, Mr. Brink. So what? Business is business, Mr. Brink. You signed the contract. It's right here, November 13th. Whereas... My appendix is about to be removed. I promise to pay $10 down and $5 weekly until the operation is mine. Signed and sealed, Walpole Brink. So what? When do you intend to pay it, Mr. Brink? Well, not right away. The car on the washing machine came before Walpole's appendix. Yeah. The scar's on me, but the operation's on you, get it? (laughs) In other words, you're repudiating your medical contract. hmm? Yeah. Now, what are you going to do about it? There's only one thing my client can do about it. Obviously. Hand me my ether can, Corpus. What's the ether for? Yeah, what are you going to do, Doc? I'm going to exercise my rights under Clause 7 of your contract. What's Clause 7? To wit. If you fail to meet your payments, the doctor can reopen his claim. You mean... Exactly. I'm putting back your appendix. for the town hall news, ladies and gentlemen. And in just a minute, we'll have something for you in the way of local trivia. Did you say in uh, just a minute, Fred? Well, about a minute, Harry. I wouldn't sell my soul for a few seconds. Well, now, that's just my point, Fred. I'd like to bet that there isn't one person in a hundred listening in right now who can tell how long a minute really is. Well, I'd even forget my uh, Puritan upbringing long enough to bet on that, Harry. (laughs) All right, all right. Now, wait a minute. Don't any of you look at your watches now. Peter, you give me a starting signal, and when any of you think I've talked a minute, you stop me. Okay, Peter. Now, a minute's a pretty short time, but in even less than a minute, you can start getting after one of the most annoying things that can happen to you, a cold. And you can do it by taking sal hepatica, two teaspoonfuls in a glass of water. Because when you have a cold, there are two things you want to get after right away. First, the wastes in your body, and second, the acid in your system that encourages your cold. And salopatica is the mineral salt laxative that gets after both. It not only rids your body of waste, but it also combats acidity. And that's something no ordinary laxative does. So just remember, at the first sign of a cold, two teaspoonfuls of salopatica. I think the minute's up, Harry. You know, Fred, it was less than 40 seconds. See, I told you. Ladies and gentlemen, it took less than 40 seconds to remind you of something many people have been remembering for 40 years. Salopatica, for the smile of health. Steeden and the Ipana Troubadours have just played I've Got My Fingers Crossed. Now, ladies and gentlemen, on Sunday morning, Deacon Ball will preach here at the hall. The Deacon's sermon will be Skiing on the Sabbath or Are Our American Girls Backsliding on Their Weekend? <laughs> Mr. Allen! Mr. Allen! Quiet, quiet, please. If that's some carnival man trying to open a peep show, there won't be a peep out of you if I come down there. Hello. Well, sir, as I live and wonder whether this jumping in my vest is hope springing eternal or just another heart attack, if it isn't Portland. Yes, Papa set me out to buy a mousetrap, and that got me thinking about cheese. I know, and thinking about cheese reminded you of me. 
What does Papa want with a mouse trap? Well, last night he heard mice pacing up and down in the pantry. Mice pacing up and down? Mice don't go stomping around people's pantries. A mouse generally sneaks in, eats his fill, and then quietly falls asleep. Yes, but our mice are eating Mama's coffee, and it keeps them awake. Really? <laughs> keeps them awake nights, eh? Huh? <laughs> just, just don't leave a mouse hanging suspended there in time, you know. It says it keeps them awake nights, right? <laughs> right. If I ever build a... <laughs> Say, that mouse might go on for generations. The unknown mouse hanging in midair because you didn't tell how long he'd been asleep. If I ever build a house, I'm going to put in rubber walls. To keep out mice? You bet. The mouse gnaws through a rubber wall, and as soon as he comes out on the other side, the hole snaps together behind him. And then what? When the mouse turns around and sees the hole is gone, he thinks he's hatched. <laughs> It unbalances him mentally. You don't need a trap. I couldn't get a trap. The man's running us his cat till he gets some in. A cat, hey? Well, after looking at your father all these years, another puss around the house ought to be a relief. <laughs> oh, I get it. Well, this cat will get results. He's pretty tough. How tough? <laughs> How tough is he? He went down to the Roxy Theater yesterday, and Mickey Mouse is in lights. This cat spit out the word mouse, bulb by bulb. Hey, pretty tough. We had a cat tougher than that, though. How tough was your cat? He thought Joe Brown's mouth was a rat hole. <laughs> he sat down beside it two nights while Joe was asleep and dared Joe's tonsils to come up. <laughs> I ought to tell Papa about your cat. Yes, and you'd better run along home now before before you forget the details. Oh, no. I've got important business here oh, first. Oh, not here. Miss You're... Snell. You've got Hello. the wrong... No. no. Yes, Bobby. I'm ready. Come on up, Herma. Yes, Miss Phil. I can't stay long, though. Yeah. Uh... <laughs> What's that hanging out of your collar, mister? <laughs> what are you laughing at, Yoko? Oh, 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 oh that's your face. <laughs> I didn't know what it was till your mouth opened. <laughs> Herman's a mailman, Mr. Allen. A mailman? I've never seen a mailman with five bags before. Herman only has one bag, Mr. Allen. What one bag? He's got two in the knees of his pants, one under each eye, and a bag on his back. Five bags. <laughs> Herman is with me, young man. And Miss Shrill is a Stratton soloist, Mr. Allen. And you can say that again, Forty. All right. Miss Shrill is a Stratton soloist, Mr. Allen. Now, wait a minute. Wait a minute. You can unsay it again, as far as I'm concerned. What's a Scranton soloist? Young man, I'm studying voice through the mail. Well, if you're giving a recital at the post office, thanks for the warning. Yeah, now, mind your fancy talk, stupid. I'm apt to cool off and gel all over you. Oh. <laughs> Old man quiver, hey? Oh, stop, Mr. Allen. Miss Shrill wants to sing for you. Indeed, I'm simply dying to dash off a chanson. I distinctly hear opportunity knocking. After you sing, you'll hear a knocking that'll make you think the four Marx brothers are at the door with their arms full of woodpecker. <laughs> oh, I wouldn't say that. You don't have to say it. I've already said it. <laughs> She'll fool you. I was pretty disgusted when I delivered her first lesson. Oh, remember, Herman? <laughs> I me 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 around the house for two whole months. <laughs> when did you really get going, Miss Shrill? Well, in the spring of 33. I brought her her first scale. It was a special delivery. Oh, fun symphonic memories. Do, re, mi, fa, so, do, do. What comes after solo, Herman? Plexus, plexus. <laughs> It's, 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 it's Tito. Oh, yes. Oh, fickle memory. Tea, tea, tea. You know, my tea was always weak. Weak tea always tastes like rainwater to you me. You keep out of this, Morton. Keep out of this argument. Now, let me see. Uh, when did I stop my pear-shaped tone, Thelma? In January 34, it was. The flap was open on your lesson. I remember I peeked. <laughs> pear-shaped tones, Miss Shrill. Why, these, dear girl. Ooh. If those are pear-shaped, the stem of that pear is caught in your larynx. <laughs> Miss Shrill spent months at her aunt's aunties and her obligados. Yes, and I was delivering shirt shows to the house so long, I was beginning to feel like the laundry man. <laughs> oh, yes. A correspondent school singer would be lost without her mailman. Herman always 
accompanies me at my recital. Yep, and I got my flute right here. <laughs> Gosh, that's good, Herman. Yeah, I know it. You'd never guess it, though. But I learned the flute through the mail, too. You should play it through the mail, second class. <laughs> Opera Wagner Wheels, Miss Shrill? No, 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 no. No opera party. I have a symphonic yen. I'm ready, Miss Shrill. Name your weapon. I shall do Ho the Gentle Lark. Oh, that's swell. I know that. Ho, ho, and it comes out lark. Stop it. Stop it, Portland. That may be lark to you, but it's off key sparrow to me. Very well, I'm ready, Herman. The Gentle Lark and Pizzicato, if you please. Low here, the gentle lark. Low here, the gentle lark. Look! 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 Now, wait a minute. Wait a minute. <laughs> Just a minute. Now, I'm no bird lover, but you can't do that to a lark in here. <laughs> The lark was barely off the ground. I generally think it in full flight. Well, let's skip the singing and get right down to your full flight. Oh, this is insubordination. Granton will hear about this, Mr. Allen. You bet, Scranton will. And Miss Shrill... <laughs> Miss Shrill's next recital will be given at the dead letter office. And this slow leak with his pizzicato here... <laughs> Open your mouth again, Cad, and you'll take this flute internally. <laughs> Why, the postal authorities will look into this, Mr. Allen. Just tell them Miss Shrill's mouth was opened here by mistake. <laughs> In other words, you want me to pick up my lock and go. Yes, always remember a bird in the hand is worth two in the offing. Goodbye, folks. So long, Portland. Howie, ho! <laughs> Now the Town Hall Quartet, ladies and gentlemen. Tonight, the boys throw ashes on the stage to sing Slip Horn Sam. You've heard of Reuben Off and his violin. Ted Lewis and his clarinet, of course you've heard of him. Perhaps you like piano when Ellington plays that thing. Or maybe it's the organ of which says Crawford's king. You can have old Pete and his piccolo, or others you can get. Cause when it comes to music, you ain't heard nothing yet. Like the birds that sing in the month of May, that's the way it sounds when he hits his A. That slip horn Sam and his old trombone. With a little slide of his band up horn, to make you see a bright spring more. That slip horn Sam and his old trombone. Just a change of tone and a different strain With a touch of a minor key You feel all alone out in the rain No one for company When he gets hot and goes to town He does his stuff and it brings him down That slip horn Sam and his old trombone Now here's how Sam learned to play trombone He can easy lessons right at home He practiced hard for a year, you see And finally finished lesson number three And this is the way he played after six months' time, he learned new tricks and finally mastered lesson number six, and this is the way he played. He practiced hard, and in two years' time, he at last arrived at lesson number nine, and this is the way he played. After lesson number ten, the boy left home. Got a job with a band and ideas all his own, and this is the way he played. He blows through his ears, and the music goes round and round. Just a change of tone and a different strain With a touch of a minor key You feel all alone out in the rain No one for company And when he gets hot and goes to town He does his stuff and it brings him down That's Slip Horn Sam Slip Horn Sam and his old Quartet who have just sung, or which has just sang, or say, <laughs> say Harry, my erudite friend, which is correct? Well, now, Fred, uh, what you obviously need is an intelligence test. An intelligence test? Uh, Why doesn't somebody tell me these things? 
No, now, wait a minute. Just concentrate, Fred. I'll ask you three questions, you see, and if you get just one of them right, you get 100%. Sounds like a shell game to me, but uh, proceed, Professor. All right. Now, what, for instance, is the population of Bindin? What, for instance, is Bindin? Why, Fred... <laughs> Bindin is a city in French Indochina with a population of 74,000. You know, I thought it was Gunga Din's brother all the time. <laughs> What's the next one? Uh, who did Louis the Fourteenth marry and how many children did he have? Who did he marry and how... Who do you think I am, a peeping Tom? <laughs> all right, Fred, we'll skip that one. Now, here's your last chance. And if it's another Bindin... No, it isn't. Now, think, Fred. What toothpaste comes in a red and yellow striped tube and makes your gums firmer and your teeth lovelier? <laughs> That's more like it. All I have to say is I panna and I get 100%. Is that right? Right, Fred. All anyone has to say is I panna for a 100% more attractive smile. For if you just massage a little pleasant-tasting I panna into your gums every time you brush your teeth with it, you'll have firmer, healthier gums and brighter, more sparkling teeth. So remember, I panna for the smile of beauty. With that, we wrap up the first half of Town Hall Tonight, starring Fred Allen from 88 years ago, January 22nd, 1936. Uh, you're listening to a Monday edition of Classic Radio Theater with Wyatt Cox, where variety is what we're all about today. Hang on, and we'll get back to more of Town Hall Tonight. In case of enemy attack or grave national emergency, keep listening to your radio. The emergency broadcast system will immediately bring you official information and instructions. Stations will not give call letters, but will identify the area they're serving. So dial around till you find the right one in your area, and then follow the instructions given. And we mentioned earlier you can get a lot of this civil defense information at civildefensemuseum.com online. Civildefensemuseum.com. On uh, Tuesday's Classic Radio Theater with Wyatt Cox, we'll deal with crime and weirdness and other stuff. The Crime Club, uh, we'll have that from Mutual from 1947. Inner Sanctum Mysteries from 1945. Dr. Christian and Something Mellow dealing with the Brent family from 1938. We'll go to Oklahoma City for an episode of Dark Fantasy. And even more horrifying than that, we'll see about Lum and Abner. That'll be coming up on tomorrow's Classic Radio Theater with Wyatt Cox. But let's roll on this Monday with more of Fred Allen and Town Hall Tonight as it was broadcast 88 years ago today, January 22nd, 1936. come to the mighty Alan Art players, ladies and gentlemen, the first actors to discover that no matter which one of Shakespeare's plays they presented, it turned out to be much ado about nothing. Tonight, these bold weevils in the field of drama present a modern mystery playlet entitled Mumbo, or Who Stole the Elephant from Billy Nose's finale. Over to your Peter. <laughs> cars stand by, calling Detective One Long Pan. Robbery at Hippodrome Theater. Two elephants stolen. Mumbo matinee may be postponed. Calling Detective One Long Pan. Proceed to Hippodrome Theater. I don't know. Yeah, which one of you is Billy Nose? I'm Nose, officer. I'm Detective Muldoon. What's going on here? My two elephants, Mumbo and Gumbo, have been stolen. Didn't you get my report at headquarters? We got a report, but the chief couldn't spell elephants. He wrote down two lost elks. I just raided the elks club. <laughs> oh, this is terrible. My show is ruined. Now, cool off, Nose. This mystery is as good as solved. I'm only prologue. I've called in one long pan. <laughs> Speak of the devil, here he is now. Hi-ho, hi-ho, everybody. Greetings, salutations. <laughs> Long pan here to solve mystery. Who is missing? This is Mr. Nose. Oh, Mr. Nose is missing? Here he is. Mystery solved. I'm not missing. It's my two elephants, Mumbo and Gumbo. They were stolen from the theater during the night. That's right, Long Pan. They disappeared into thin air. No, no. Elephant may disappear, but they uh, never seen. <laughs> Who saw Elephant last? I saw him in finale. Who are you, Flapper? I'm Gloria Fluff, the leading lady. Leading lady. You, you lead Elephant home after the show? Indeed not. I went home alone. Why, yes. I know Miss Fluff. She wouldn't go out with an elephant. <laughs> it's upset. 
chorus girl burlesque show many times seen with trunk. Oh, very good, very good. Exceptional. Good, good. Okay, now keep your mind on the case, Long Pan. Yes, I've got a hundred bad jokes in the show, but only two elephants. Maybe elephant walk out on bad joke, Mr. No. No, the elephants couldn't walk out. The stage doorman was here all night. Yeah? Where is this doorman? We'll grill him. In the green room, right through here. Yeah, very good, very good. Oh, look at him. He's dead to the world. Yeah, it smells as though he's been drinking shellac. Aesop say, man who drinks shellac have beautiful finish. <laughs> Come on, come on, snap out of it, buddy. Come on, wake up. Oh, yeah, 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 what's the matter? What's the matter? Oh, oh hello, Mr. No. Wake up, Joe. Mumbo and Gumbo have been stolen. You say elephant napper nap elephants last night? No, I didn't see nothing. You come clean, Joe. Last night you drink too much. Pass out. See uh, elephant and sleep. That's right. I saw four elephants. Two of them was lavender. So you say, you open stage door, tell lavender elephant to scram, no? That's right, I did. I tell you. And Mumbo and Gumbo must have scrammed too, Mr. Nose. But they couldn't get out of the theater, Muldoon. They were tied. Mr. Mr. Nose, like somebody filch elephant, pay a larceny. Long Pan got hunch. Yours, telephone. Oh, well, here's a phone right here, Long Pan, an outside line. Thank you. Hello? Hello? You give me blind nine, total six six. Hello? Uh, hello, this Republican in club? Yes, who is this, Herb? No, no. <laughs> Herb out of town. Detective, one along pond speaking. You got elephant there? No, we Republicans lost our elephant last election. <laughs> they got our goat, too. <laughs> Any luck, Long Pan? No, no, discover no mystery. Goat missing, too. Uh, now, one mystery at a time, Long Pan. Yes, let's find my elephants first. A happy suggestion. Long Pan, look at elephant bed. Maybe a fine club. Well, it's right out here, Long oh, Pan. Let's go. Very good. Now, here's the corner. They were tied to these stakes. Sure, sure. Elephant gone, but Melody linger on. <laughs> Aesop say, get some type, Muldoon. Uh, it's that hay, Long Pan. I always sneeze around hay. I got hay fever. Hay fever, very bad. Make nose run like a day clock. Achoo! I got it awful. I can smell hay a mile away. Mile away? Excellent, Muldoon. Your sneeze will solve mystery. This uh, mystery's not to be sneezed at, Long Pan. <laughs> What's Muldoon's hay fever got to do with my missing elephant? Elephant eat hay. With hay fever, Muldoon will smell hay on elephant breath. Uh, you see? Come on, now, get me away from this hay. Here. Yes, Long Pam, what's our next move? We, uh, we all go out and sleep uh, in total. Stop at every door. Muldoon sneeze, we suspect hay in house. Definitely knock on door. Let's go. <laughs> Long Pam, this won't work. Oh, you, you'll keep muffler on, Mr. Lowe's. We catch guilty party. You, uh, you try this house, Muldoon. Take a big inhale. You, you catch clothes? No, no, there's no hay here. How about this house? You inhale. Encore, Muldoon. No. Hey, wait a minute. Me nose tickles. You, you check, check, Muldoon. Both nostrils. <laughs> you see, very good, very good. Hey, positively. I ring bell. If my elephants are only here, I can still give them matinee. Well, what is it? You, you're still two elephants, madam. Go away, you Chinese stew. I'll call a cop. Chinese stew. I am officer, madam. Who lives here? Mr. Bruce. What's his first name, lady? Hayward. Good day. <laughs> oh, 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 you bad boy. Bad boy, Maldon. You'll give one long pan, bum steer. Well, I'm sorry, long pan. That hay and Hayward fooled me. Yeah, if we pass the courthouse, he'll sneeze at the habeas corpus. You keep a picture, they tell how Mr. Nose. Okay, Muldoon, next house. You, you inhale here. Okay. <laughs> this is probably Lenny Hayton's place. Quiet, quiet, no. Long pan, Ling Bell. <laughs> it's pretty strong here, Long Pan. Somebody's coming. Well, what is it? I am one detective, one long pan, madam. I don't need no long pan. My icebox drains itself. Oh, <laughs> very funny, very funny, madam. But the beside point, have you seen two elephant, madam? Why, why no. You, uh, you stand back, lady. We search house and them alone. Well, of all the nerves. Yeah, this is the parlor. They're not in here. Very good, very good. You inhale, Mogdon. Ah, <laughs> 
My nose tells me it's in that room, Long Pan. One strike, madam. Oh. Long Pan investigates that room. Oh, you can't go in there. No, no. Oh. She's fainted. Women always faint at a crucible moment. Stand back. Long Pan, open door. Mumbo! Oh. You gumbo! Oh. Say, what do you know? Both elephants is here. Great work, Long Pan. Long Pan, many times insolvent, but never fail. I'll get Mumbo and Gumbo back to the theater. Come on, Mumbo. <laughs> We'll talk later, Nose. Soon as we pinch this dame. Oh, oh where am I? You see, lady, come to. Elephant passing, even revived dead man. You're under arrest, lady. You're still elephant, lady. We catch you with plunk down. Yes, I took them. The Hippodrome stage door was open this morning. I had to have those two elephants. You had to have two elephants, lady? For what? My husband brought home a book. It was so big, I was afraid it would fall over and kill us both. Ah, uh, Mr. Saul, you'll need two elephants for bookend. What book would need elephants for bookend? Very simple, Anthony Adverse. <laughs> And now that the mighty Alan Art players are bedded down for the evening, we have a mighty afterpiece for you, ladies and gentlemen, with a cast of 60,000 and two players. The scene, a sports arena. The 60,000. And now, the other two players. Boy, did you ever see such a quick knockout? Uh-huh. What? Oh, didn't you see that right to the kid's jaw? No, I, I wasn't looking. Well, for Pete's sake, where were you looking at, huh? That girl over there. Oh, oh boy, what a smile. <laughs> Well, now, maybe the smile was a knockout, too. Most smiles are, if the teeth they frame are brilliant and sparkling. Just brushing them with toothpaste, though, isn't enough. For in the words of a prominent dentist... Our teeth are seldom white and brilliant if our gums are soft and tender. And we're often so lazy in the matter of chewing. And we eat so many soft, creamy foods that our gums lose their tone and condition. That is when Pink Toothbrush warns us our gums are tender and need exercise. And there's an easy and pleasant way to give it to them. With Ipana toothpaste and massage. If you just massage a little Ipana into your gums every time you brush your teeth with it, you'll tone and stimulate them. Make them strong and healthy. And at the same time, you'll have cleaner, whiter, brighter teeth. Just ask anyone who uses it if it isn't well worth remembering Ipana for the smile of beauty. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, Town Hall continues immediately after your station announcement. Got a brand new suit, got a brand new tie, got a brand new twinkle in my eye. Do you know the reason why I got a brand new girl? And a wounded shoe. She's the reason I got a brand new tie and a brand new suit. When I'm with her, gotta look my best. Put on my tan shoes, raise pants, double rested vest, go to wear my skin. Back in town hall, friends, and you've just heard Peter Van Steeden and the Ipana Troubadours play Got a Brand New Suit with a vocal chorus for the town hall quartet. Now here's Fred with a new group of anxious and eager amateurs. Let's give them a real town hall reception. Thank you. Yes, ladies and gentlemen, Uncle here, Jim, is here tonight again with his wards. And our amateurs are going to compete this evening for a first prize of $50 in a week's engagement at the Roxy Theater in New York City and a second prize of $25 in cash. Now, you folks here in the town hall will select the winners. Your applause after each act will be registered on the Johns Manville applause machine here on the stage, and the three acts receiving the highest applause ratings will be called back later for your final vote. Now, first tonight, I am happy to have you meet four boys from Waterbury, Connecticut. The ABC Quartet, Wilfred Greenblatt, Daniel Barrett, Henry Gauthier, and Dick Brown. Is that right, boys? That's right. right. Waterbury, Connecticut, eh? Uh, what is a, before we get started, what is ABC, the ABC Quartet? What does ABC stand for? It's uh, spent for All Brass City. Oh, All Brass City. I right. thought it might have been another government project out that I didn't <laughs> understand about it. 
I, uh, uh, well, there was another famous quartet a few years back. Did you know the Elm City Four? I know Jim Carty and... Jim Carty and... Harry uh, Morris. Harry Morris. They both come from up in Connecticut, don't yes, they? that's right. That was a fine quartet and played many seasons in uh, White Scandals. That's right. What is Jim doing now? Jim's running uh, an inn up in Newington. Uh, an inn? Is that a high class where... Just what is he running up there? <laughs> well, uh... Define that inn. <laughs> it's, uh, it isn't... It's... The roadhouse, more or less. Oh, it's dining it? and dancing. And oh, I heard it was a diner. I thought you were just putting on a nail there. But... No, they, uh... I thought you were making the place a little bigger in conversation for Jim up there. Well, they've made it bigger since you've been up there. Perhaps. Well, that's fine. It started with... I was glad to hear that he was on the wagon originally. Now, <laughs> he's branched out into a roadhouse. That's swell. Well, Waterbury is a very fine city. The home of Yale University. Uh, oh, no, it isn't, is it? <laughs> That's New Haven. That's right. New Haven is the home of Yale University. Well, I have one of those, uh, those ten-cent maps, and on my map, Yale goes over into Waterbury. It's very <laughs> embarrassing. Well, uh, boys, what are you going to sing? Tiger Rag. The Tiger Rag, the ABC right. Quartet. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, from Waterbury, Connecticut. And now I would like to have you meet Miss Eleanor Bendo and Miss Dorothy Edmonds. Good evening, girls. Good evening. Uh, which is which, may I ask? Who is Miss... I'm guilty of being Dorothy Edmonds. You're Dorothy Edmonds, and you are... Eleanor Bendo. Well, you see, now, there's only one of me, fortunately, so you <laughs> girls won't be confused. <laughs> is this your home, Miss uh, Bendo? No, this isn't. My home is in Cleveland, Ohio. Cleveland, is it really? And Miss Edmonds? I'm from Edmonton, Alberta, Canada. Oh, from Alberta. Okay. I worked there many years ago on the Pan Time, Pantages Time. Pantages Theater? I guess you were too young then, though, to be going. <laughs> I, uh, what are you girls, you don't mind if I ask you what you're doing in New York, do you? No. What are you doing? Well, I am uh, studying in the hopes of being a singer and working as a sales lady at oh. home aside. You're studying music, boys? Yes, yes, they both are. Well, that's swell. What do you? What, what is your ultimate uh, ambition? To sing in, in the radio or in the theater or where? Uh, Both radio or opera, either one. Oh, opera have, too. Hope so. Oh, that's that's fine. I think that anyone with the talent and ability and and uh, stick to itiveness is very important if you're going to attain your ambition. You have to stick to anything if you're going to be a success, unless of course you're selling porous plasters, and then your <laughs> success will depend upon someone else sticking to it. Well, uh, what are you girls going to sing? The Huguette Waltz. The Hugo the what? The Huguette Waltz from the Vagabond King. Oh, thank you very much. <laughs> Oh. 
Thank you very much. That was Miss Eleanor Bando and Miss Dorothy Edmonds. And now Uncle Jim is crowding me here with the table. Uh, what is the table for, Uncle Jim? Oh, this is Tommy Dunn. Am I right? That's right, Fred. Uh, Tommy Dunn from Broad Channel, New York, ladies and gentlemen. Where is Broad Channel? Don't, uh, Uncle Jim, now don't confuse the thing. Tommy and I'll get along all right. Uncle Jim is fixing a table and a harmonica I see there. How old are you, Tommy? Eighteen. Eighteen, really? Yes. Uh, where is Broad Channel? We oh, measure... It's out near the Rockaways. Out near the Rockaways, yes. eh? You go to school? <laughs> yes. You go to school out there? Yes. You do, huh? Yes. You look uh, with the sweater on with this large C. What does that C stand for? That stands for the Broad Channel Cardinals, our club. Oh, a uh, football team, is it? Everything. Oh, it's everything. <laughs> Every kind of thing. Well, you don't play all these things at the same time, do you? Sometimes. Uncle Jim told me that you're interested in boxing. Is that right? Yes, that's right. He told me also that you expect to go uh, enter the Golden Glove Contest this year. Yes, that's right. You do, really? Yes. What's your weight? Uh, 118. 118, huh? I used to think I was quite a boxer years ago. <laughs> Got monotonous, though. I finally gave it up. Every time I boxed, I was in the rope so much, people thought it was a rodeo. They went home during the thing. I'd like to try out. Do you mind if I try out some of your defense there to see if you're ready for the Golden oh, Glove? Sure. What's your defense for a left jab, say? My left hand. Your left hand comes up. And a left hook? A right hand. A right hand. Right and hand. Uh, the, the uppercut? <laughs> well, let me try it. All right. <laughs> no, we'll end it. You see, in all of my fighting, I never had to bother. I just threw one punch and then landed. Okay. Can I take off my sweater now? I can't work on Yes, the go ahead. Tommy has to take off his sweater. Now, as I understand it, he's going to play the harmonica standing on your head or your hands. Which is it? On your hands, sir. We have a table here and a little book. I might as well tell you the book is the Economy Cookbook. I mean, the mouth organ is set on the side of the book. I guess that's in case Tommy gets hungry while he's doing the trick. He opens that up and reads a recipe. He's going to play the harmonica standing on his hands. All right, Tommy. Thank you very much, Tommy. And now, ladies and gentlemen, Charles Chancer from Brooklyn. Mr. Chancer, how are you? How do you do, Mr. Allen? Allen is my name. You are, a, uh, <laughs> you are a pianist and a songwriter, is that right? That's right. Have you written many numbers? I've written several numbers, yes. Have you? Had any published yet? I've had the good fortune to have one published, the song I'm going to play. Uh, how long after you had written it was the song published? Well, about a year and a half. A year and a half, eh? Must have had a lot of merit to have the publishing postponed that long. <laughs> Look at that song, uh, uh, The Music Goes Round and whatever it is, you know that? And round. The, the fellas who wrote that, that was published right away, I understand. The fellas who wrote it didn't even have time to, they ran out of words before they got to the middle <laughs> of it. They had to put in some ho-ho-hos there or something. <laughs> I guess they put the hoes in so they'd have a sock number. That was probably it. <laughs> what are you going to uh, play for us, Mr. Chancer? The song is called After Dark. After Dark. Your own original composition, huh? Right. Well, you go right ahead. I will uh, do a Highland Fling here at the microphone, pending television. I'll see how it... <laughs> I'll probably win the contest with my fling. Thank you. <laughs> dark Oh, we're far apart After dark You creep into my heart Every night When no one's inside like a thief You steal into my life With the dawn I'm left with just a memory Love is gone Please come 
come back to me after dark when the day is through in my dream I'll always wait for you Charles, that was Charles Chancer of Brooklyn playing his own composition after dark. And now, ladies and gentlemen, a tiny little lady, Miss Eleanor Freeze. Is that right, Miss Freeze? Yes, that's right. Rather a frosty name, isn't it? <laughs> Would you mind speaking up, guys? How tall are you? I'm as tall as Mary Pickford, Mr. Allen. As tall four as... Four foot nine. Four foot nine, hey? Yes. Eleanor Freeze. It looks as though you had settled down during the course of <laughs> freezing there. What are you going to, uh, uh, you have musical chimes. That's an odd-looking, uh, instrument, isn't it? Yes. It's sort of a xylophone with bells in place of the wooden top. Uh, is that a, a well-known instrument? Is it something that you worked out yourself? No, it's something that my dad brought, uh, home from Europe. Oh, from Europe, huh? He's, uh, not living now. He bought them for my fourth birthday. And, uh, he died before I was five, so he never heard me play them. Well, that's too bad. You've kept them ever since, huh? Yes, I have. have you practiced on them ever since you've been four? Well, since I was about five or six. Well, that's fine. I, I was a little worried. When Uncle Jim told me that you played the chimes, I thought that we'd have to ask the studio audience to follow you up in some belfry to see how it was <laughs> done. But fortunately, you have the portable chimes. So I'm going to ask you, what, what selection are you going to play? I'm playing the glowworm. The glowworm. Thank you very much. And we'll hear what that young lady was going to play with the glow worm in just a moment here on this Monday Classic Radio Theater with Wyatt Cox. More of Fred Allen and Town Hall to tie it tonight. But first, a quick message. Civil defense is common sense. This is Joni James. After nuclear attack, a radioactive fallout will be a potential threat to every living thing. You can't hear or smell or taste fallout. Often you can't see it, uh, so you must take shelter and stay there until told it's safe to leave. Now on Classic Radio Theater with Wyatt Cox, the conclusion of Fred Allen's Town Hall tonight from 88 years ago. That was January 22nd, 1936, and let's listen to this uh, glowworm, I think it is. And now, ladies and gentlemen, from Miss Freeze, we go to Miss Lillian. Pardon me, what is Freiser? From Miss Freeze to Miss Lillian Freiser. I uh, <laughs> out of the frying pan into the Freiser, huh? And you are from the Bronx, Miss Freiser. Yes. Uh, you uh, you are a singer, huh? Yes. How did you ever get down from the Bronx tonight? With dog sled or something? No. I heard the snow is pretty deep up there. Is it? Yes. It is. Where do you live? East Bronx, Prospect Avenue. Oh, Prospect Avenue. You know, I heard the snow was so deep up there around 159th Street that some boys made a snowman on the sidewalk there, 
and one of the uh, put a broom in the snowman's hand, and one of those WPA executives came along and handed the snowman a check yesterday. <laughs> Thought he was uh, working on a project out there, just a little confused. Well, what are you going to sing, Miss Freezer? Miss, uh, uh, Miss Freezer, I beg your pardon. Eeny, meeny, miny, mo. Eeny, meeny, miny, mo. Thank you. Eeny, meeny, miny, mo. Catch trouble by the toe. If it hollers, let it go. Let it fly away. Eeny, meeny, miny, mo. Hear it anywhere you go, any time of day. Big Ben rings it, Valley sings it, Wiseman swings it, even Mr. Crosby brings it. Eeny, meeny, minor mo, can't trouble by the toe. If it hollers, let it go, let it fly away. Big Ben rings it, Valley sings it, Wiseman swings it. Crosby brings it, eeny, meeny, minor, mo, can't trouble by the toe, if Hollis let it go, let it fly away. Thank you. That was Miss Lillian Pfizer. Thank you very much. And that completes our amateur contest for tonight, ladies and gentlemen. And while I look at the applause machine, I'm going to ask Harry to take the microphone in hand and say a few words. Harry. Ladies and gentlemen, for the many letters of appreciation you've written Fred in Portland... They are sincerely grateful. And for the many friendly letters you've written us about the two products that make these hours of smiles possible every Wednesday, we are deeply grateful. Thank you all for remembering Ipana for the smile of beauty and Sal Hepatica for the smile of health. Ipana, Sal Hepatica. Peter, thanks very much. You ready, Fred? Yes, Harry. Ladies and gentlemen, the applause meter divulges that your applause has been heaviest for the following acts. The ABC Quartet, uh, Tommy Dunn, and Miss Eleanor Freeze. Now, I'm going to ask Harry to hold his fragile mitt, spelled M-I-T-T, over the heads of these boys and girls. And as I call, <laughs> call the names, I'm going to ask you to kindly applaud once again for your winners. Are you ready, Harry? Already, Fred. Now, first, the four boys who are so kind are kind enough to come down from Waterbury, Connecticut, the ABC Quartet. <laughs> Next, the young man who played the harmonica standing on his hands, the boy from Broad Channel down near the Rockaways. Master Tommy Dunn. <laughs> and then the young lady who played uh, the glow worm on her musical chimes, Miss Eleanor Freed. <laughs> Thank you. Now, what does the machine say, Harry? Just a second. I, uh, we had to come at such a distance, ladies and gentlemen, that the winner came in a relay from the machine to Uncle Jim to Harry Von Zell, and here it is. The first prize, $50 in cash, and a week's engagement at the Roxy Theater in New York City goes to the young gentleman who exemplified the fine art of playing the mouth organ through standing on his hands, Tommy Dunn. With a decibel rating of 76. The second prize, $25 in cash, goes to the young lady with the musical chimes, Miss Eleanor Freeze. Thank you. I'm sorry that we all couldn't win, but thank you for coming, and better luck next time. Thank you. This is Fred Allen saying good night, ladies and gentlemen, and inviting you to another hour of smiles next Wednesday evening at the Old Town Hall. Portland, the mighty Allen art players, Peter Van Steen, the Arpana Troubadours, the Town Hall Quartet, and another group of high-test amateurs. We'll all be looking for you, so don't forget, this is Fred Allen saying good night. Heard on this program, I've got my fingers crossed from King of Burlesque, and I've got a brand new suit from at home abroad. This is the National Broadcasting Company.
Even on the national level in 1936, amateur hours were still very, very uh, important part of radio programming. And for somebody as big as Fred Allen. 88 years ago, January 22nd, 1936, Town Hall Tonight here on Classic Radio Theater with Wyatt Cox on this Monday will go next to uh, Philco Radio Time starring Bing Crosby from 77 years ago, January 22nd, 1947. That is up next. In case of national civil defense emergency, the emergency broadcast system may be activated. Then you would receive essential information by turning your radio dial to an EBS station operating in your area. The emergency broadcast system stations will be easy to identify because of their repeated announcements of the area they're serving. Great information on all the stuff you hear about here at CivilDefenseMuseum.com. Uh, right now, let us go to the Philco Radio Time. Why did the Philco Radio Time come about? And that was because Bing Crosby didn't want to do live shows. He didn't want to, He wanted to rec- pre-record his shows, transcribe his shows. And uh, thanks to his investment in something called Ampex tape recording. He was able to record his shows, and and to be honest, the recording of shows helped a lot of big names be able to do some work in radio. Um, A lot of that Bold Ventures, one example, with Humphrey Bogart and uh, Lauren Bacall and a lot of other shows. Uh, Pre-recording made a big deal of difference. Now, Philco Radio Time is this what we're about to hear. Uh, January 22nd, 1947, 77 years ago today, starring Der Bingle, Bing Crosby. When the blue of the night meets the gold of the day, someone waits for me. Welcoming you to Philco Radio Time, produced and transcribed in Hollywood with John Scott Trotter, his orchestra and chorus, Skitch Henderson, Lena Romai, and Bing's guests, the famous group that have been trying to get Richard to open that door, Jack McVeigh and his all-stars, and George Jessel. Now, if uh, Mr. C will put down that book he's reading, we can get going. So I took four bows in Hollandia, uh, six uh, bing, bows bing, 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 This is a very interesting tome. It's Bob Hope's new book, so this is peace. Oh, but uh, Bing, Bob's book's been out for some time. Why are you just reading it now? It took me till now to get a free copy, Ken. Oh, I see. <laughs> Had to give him four Philcos and an old broken-down filly of mine. <laughs> <laughs> you got off easy. <laughs> you know, Bing, I think Bob is a very talented writer. You are right. He's another Edgar Allan Pugh. <laughs> he's <gone. laughs> That's a good book. It really is. It's a darn... I've got to lay it aside now, however, and get to work, unless I want to collect my loot from Pepsodent this week. Shall we zip through Zip-a-dee-doo-dah, gang? zip a dee zip a dee doo da zip a dee My, oh, my, what a wonderful day. Plenty of sunshine heading my way. Zippity doo da, zippity a. Mr. Bluebird on my shoulder. It's the truth, it's actual. Everything is satisfactual. Zippity doo da, zippity a. Wonderful feeling, wonderful day. Zippity doo da, zippity a. Wonderful feeling, wonderful day. Plenty of sunshine coming my way. How would it be the battle? Zippity do da, zippity a. How would it be the battle? Zippity do da, zippity a. D a d a. My oh my, what a wonderful day. Zippity do da, zippity a. D a d a. Plenty of sunshine heading my way, Mr. Blue. Bird on my shoulder. It's the truth, it's actual. Everything is satisfactual. Zippity doo da, zippity a. Wonderful feeling, wonderful day. Zippity doo, zippity doo, zippity doo da, zippity doo da. Beetle, beetle, bottle, bootle, bottle, 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 bounce. Uh, 
that number is from Walt Disney's Song of the South, based on the famous Uncle Remus stories, isn't it? Yes, it is, Ken, but uh, why the sudden interest in Uncle Remus? Is it commercial time in the Briar Patch? <laughs> Say, that reminds me, Bing. I thought it would, yes. <laughs> reminds me about the Philco 1201, the easiest radio phonograph in the world to spin your records on. Bing, that 1201 is so automatic, you can play it blindfolded. Blindfolded? I'd like to see you read a commercial that way. <laughs> Then you can put a blindfold on me right now and I could go on talking about Philco's for two hours. Mm, well, if you do, we're all going to tiptoe out of the room on you, Ken. Oh, don't do that. But you're getting very sneaky. Mm -hmm. Gee whiz, you start out talking about Uncle Remus and the first thing you know, you slip in some talk about the marvelous Philco 1201 and the uh, amazing new automatic way to play records. You, you just slide your record in and it plays. Mm -hmm. No needles to change. That's right. No tone arm to touch. Yeah. How'd I get involved in all this? <laughs> Let's come over me. I'm well, Bing, you that. like everybody else have got to be enthusiastic about the 1201. And it's the newest invention from Philco, the leader. Bending over the Baldwin just now, I perceive Master Skitch Henderson ready to assist me in the ballad, If You Were the Only Girl in the World. I shall essay the opening chorus, while Skitch can be thinking of something interesting to interpolate. If you were the only girl in the world, and I were the only boy, Nothing else would matter in the world today. We could go on loving in the same old way. A garden of Eden just made for two. With nothing to mar our joy I would say Such wonderful things to you There would be Such wonderful things to do if you were the only girl in the world And I were the only boy Presenting our guest of the evening is a pleasant task indeed. 
This man is as theatrical as the spotlight that has been shining on him lo these many years. Actor, writer, producer, raconteur extraordinaire, favorite Toastmaster of presidents, my pal of the paddock, ladies and gentlemen, here is George Jessel. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. And Bing, as I stood in the offing and listening to your glowing and gracious words of introduction, a warm feeling swept over me, a feeling that seemed to say to me that surely behind this fine and generous tribute, there must be lurking a few dollars for me. (laughs) I know you're kidding, Georgie, but uh, I'm sure we can work something out later. I heard you a few weeks ago on Eddie Cantor's program. uh, What did he give you? (laughs) Now we're Bing. Uh, uh... Look, <laughs> what Cantor gave me, they haven't invented a drug to cure yet. <laughs> no, I mean, how much money did he give you, George? Shall I tell you the truth? Yeah. Gave me six dollars, portal to portal. <laughs> but Bing, seriously, do you uh, realize how many long years it is since you and I trod the boards together? All I know is, George, that we were to smash. Yes. Paramount yeah. Theater, New York, right? That's right. And the year was 1930. You have a very inconvenient memory. (laughs) (laughs) And I'll never forget you. What a sight you were, Bing, toddling in the theater with a big round hoop under your arm, Mm -hmm. little square hat on your head, and those crooked dice in your pocket. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, Those dice were made of sugar, (laughs) Joe. They didn't make any sugar for me, I remember. (laughs) But really, Bing, I still have a most vivid picture of you. And the first time I met you, there was something in your eyes. I'm just trying to recall what it was. Hair? Bing, things are bad all over. <laughs> but you were a young kid then, and well, I was young too. George, in 1930, everybody was young. That's right. <laughs> However, the intervening years have brought you success, George, brought you renown. You are now a producer at 20th Century Fox. You have attained the pinnacle of a motion picture career. Well, not quite. Hmm? There's one thing that's missing, one thing that would make me feel that I have not passed this way in vain. You mean you want your footprints in the forecourt of Grauman's Chinese Theater? No, I want the popcorn machine in the lobby. <laughs> you aspire high, George, <laughs> high. But bon chance, good luck. Merci bien, monsieur. <laughs> but really, really, Bing, working with you after all these years recalls to my mind what I said when I first saw you on the stage at the Paramount Theater. I knew it right away. I said, this fellow is a success. You know why? Because you had a distinct style. You had it then... You have it now. You're wrong, George. I lost those dice long ago. No, no, no. Long ago. No, no, no. You're too modest. It's not about the dice. I'm talking about your singing. Speaking of singing styles, we have a group with us tonight that develop tunes in their own particular way. Have you heard Jack McVeigh and his all-stars in their now famous recording of Open the Door, Richard? Open the Door, Richard? This is a song? Appears to be, Georgie. (laughs) And it appears to have caught on as one of the big novelty tunes of the year. We have Jack McVeigh and his cohorts here tonight to do Open the Door, Richard in person. Ready to knock it, Mr. C. Say, Jack, they tell me that Dick's been a little adamant about twisting the hardware for you. Hmm? Yeah, but maybe you can jump in and help us tonight. You might get him to lift the latch. I'm around. I'll be available. Available Crowthney, they call me. <laughs> Old band's been on a little party tonight. My friend Richard went home early. He's got the only key to the house. Got to knock on the door, see if I can get in. Open the door, Richard. <laughs> Don't know what's the matter with Richard. You know he sleeps in the back room and it's kind of hard to hear. Better knock on the door again. <laughs> see, Richard, I'll bump the door, man. <laughs> Don't see what's wrong with that fella. Got to try him one more time, I guess. <laughs> Open the door, Richard. Open the door and let me in. Open the door, Richard. Richard, why don't you open that door? Open the door, Richard. Open the door and let me in. Open the door, Richard. Richard, why don't you open that door? Say, Richard, open up the door, man. It's cold out here in this air. Uh Uh-oh! There's that woman across the street Looking out the window Every time I'm late, she's just looking at 
Where's he been? Where's he been? Trying to find out what's happening. Trying to find out what's happening. Yeah. <laughs> yes, it's me and I'm late again. Well, Jack, did you hear what the lady said? What'd she say, Rayburn? She said, oh, my, if it was only mine. What happened? I'd hit him in the head with the prize pong. <laughs> <laughs> say, babe, Hi. have you got a key to my front door? No, I don't have no key, Jack. I got no key. Maybe Richard's gone. Well, I know he's in there. How do you know he's in there? I can hear him breathing. <laughs> Maybe better knock one more time. Something might happen here. Say, hey, Richard, open up the door, man. I don't know what's the matter with Richard. I know Richard's in there because I got on the suit. <laughs> Let's try him one more time, Gabe. Open the door, Richard. Open the door and let me in. Open the door, Richard. Richard, why don't you open that door? Open the door, Richard. Open the door and let me in. Open the door, Richard. Richard? Richard, why don't you open that door? Come on, Rich. Now open that door, man. Yeah. That's very solid, Jack McVeigh and Ensemble. Thank you. Don't you agree, George? Well, I think that's a mighty catchy number, but uh, <laughs> I must confess, Bing, that I am partial to a more delicate and romantic type of entertainment. Something with charm and loveliness, grace and beauty. Buenas noches, senores. This is what I mean, Bing. <laughs> She'll do, huh? Definitely, definitely. Buenas noches, senorita, buenas noches. My name is Jessel, George Jessel, and it so happens that I live all by myself in a big house down at the beach. How do you do, Mr. Jessel? My name is Lena Romay, and I live in a small house in Westwood with my mother, father, three aunts, and a bulldog. <laughs> Adios, senorita, adios. My name is Bing Crosby. I live in a medium house in Bel Air, and those four little fellas out in front aren't to tie your horses to. <laughs> <laughs> but now that we know where everybody lives, shall we, like the sponsor says, put a little life into the program? <laughs> <laughs> I'm glad you mentioned that, Bing, because it leads me to business. I happen to have with me a scenario that I'd like to interest you in. A screenplay, huh? What's the title? Bessie Burke from Bolivia. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds like a natural for Lena. And for you too, Bing. And now it opens with a fanfare. Then on the screen comes George Jessel presents Daryl F. Zanuck. <laughs> <laughs> Gotta get it oh, in, you know. Oh, Daryl should love that billing. What next? <laughs> the George Jessel production produced by Daryl F. Zanuck, Bessie Burke from Bolivia, produced by Daryl F. Zanuck. You said that. Not enough. <laughs> <laughs> Gotta get you in Razor's Edge maybe later, too. <laughs> Now, here's the cast of characters. Lena Ramai plays Chiquita, the Bolivian bombshell. Wait a minute. I thought the girl's name was Bessie. Listen, Fine. Chiquita, this may be Spanish for Bessie. Who knows? Who knows? I once had an Uncle Morris Bloom. He was Chinese. You can't tell. <laughs> <laughs> no. Anyway, Georgie, who am I in the picture? Carmen Lombardo, yes. No, no. no. Bing, you play the part of M. Bingalito, the Bolivian banana king, a prince of a fellow. Oh, I have a lot of money, but I'm one of the bunch, huh? <laughs> Something you got left over from hope, I think. Yeah. <laughs> anyway, I will play the part of Professor Julius T. Labermacher, a Czechoslovakian scientist. This is a wonderful professor. He has invented a fountain pen that writes on the sour cream. <laughs> now, in the opening scene, Chiquita is singing the theme song of the picture, Brazil. Brazil? Georgie, Bolivia and Brazil are two different countries. Who are you, Joel Kupperman? <laughs> What's the difference as long as it's in technical? Have it your way. Lena, are you ready? Yes. Brazil. <laughs> Brasil Meu Brasil Brasileiro Meu mulato Insonheiro Vou cantar-te Dos meus versos Oh Brasil Samba que dá Bambuleu no faz quinga Oh Brasil no meu amor Terra de nosso Senhor Brasil 
pasado tira más preto do cerrado bota un rengón con no congado Brasil Brasil ella canta de nuevo trovador a corre a luz a lua toda cantado mi amor Esa dona caminando, pelo salú es arrastrando, el seu vestido rendado, Brasil, para mí, Brasil, para mí. Where hearts were entertaining June. We stood beneath an amber moon And softly murmured Someday soon we kissed And clung together Deja cantar de nuevo trovador Amén en corre a luz a lua Toda canca no mi amor Queiro Esa dona caminando, pelo salú es arrastrando, el se vestido rendado, Brasil, para mí, Brasil, Brasil. Bonita chiquita mia, I bring you a bunch of bananas. Eat them and you'll be gay as a little monkey. Oh, but eating all this monkey food, I am afraid if we get married... Ah, then you do think of marrying me. Oh, yes, but I feel it is not to be. Papa has promised my hand to Professor Lappemacher from Czechoslovakia. The professor does not hear good and he is very nearsighted. But Papa says I love him. Oh, here he comes to the gate now. <laughs> Over here, Professor, right? My beautiful Chiquita, kiss me. Oh. Get your mustache out of my nostrils, you old bat. Bat, 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 bat. You are speaking to Professor Julius T. Labamacher. Who you are? I am El Bingalito. <laughs> you are crossed by the croon and our fires of the <laughs> I am over here, Professor. Come, Chiquita, put my arms around you. There you are. Where is my dog? Where is it? Chiquita, you better go inside. There's a storm coming up. Richard, open the door. <laughs> Professor, that is thunder. Don't make so much noise about it. Can you write maybe on the sour cream? All right, I apologize. You try it and see how far you get. <laughs> In the small town where I live, I am the champion middleweight of the place. Champion of Yenem's Pippic, that's who I am. <laughs> and I am the first one picked out to be knocked out with my brains if I'm fighting anybody. <laughs> Congratulations, you made it. <laughs> I am sorry, Professor, but whatever it is my father says I feel for you, I no feel. This girl has a dialect. <laughs> love song. Yes, we will sing our love song. Say, I got an idea. Why don't you two kids sing a love song? That's what we're going to do right now. <laughs> oh, you wouldn't do it, huh? Well, <laughs> goodbye and thank you for your kind extension. Okay. Muchachos, viene acá con las guitarras. Señorita? Guitarras? Morachita me voy Para Te quiero mucho, también me quiere. 
čitá nevoj. A šta na kapitá, a serviral patron, e me mandoj Te quise traer, yo te quise traer, dijo que no, dijo que no, que se había de llorar, a que volver, borrachita me voy. Hasta la capital a servir al patrón que me mandó a llamar What's that? Crosby, who do I see from the Vegas here? Who give me some money? The money later, Professor. Right now we got to hustle a few Philco radios. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> of course, Professor, and hustling Philco radios is actually a cinch. All we've got to do is to get the listeners to go hear them. Because you can hear the difference the minute you dial a new Philco. More zip and sparkle, less noise and interference than ever before. And that goes for your records, too. Wait till you hear them played by Philco's patented dynamic reproducer. Here's another first from the Philco Laboratories. It's the same type tone arm used by the best broadcasting studios and now adapted to your home radio for the first time in the history of recorded music. No needles to change. You just lean back and listen to thrilling new beauty in your favorite records. Hey, one second, one oh, second, okay. Crosby. This fellow Carpenter, what is he talking about? He's talking about Philco radios. Philco radios. What Philco radios? Philco's. Everybody knows what Philco's are. Then why is he telling everybody? <laughs> Do they play on the sour cream? What is he telling you? Well, no, well, no Professor, but well, this is front page news for record fans, and we're telling everyone that Philco is first again with another great new radio development. And remember, Philco is famous for quality the world oh. over. Oh. Here's a holdover from 1946, and just as big in early 47. I love you For sentimental reasons I hope you do believe me I'll give you my heart I love you And you alone were meant for me Please give your loving heart to me And say we'll never part I think of you every morning Dream of you every night Darling, I'm never lonely Whenever you're inside Metal reasons 
Well, that about gets it, but before I amble over to Vine Street for a jumbo hamburger and a lime cola, I want to thank George Jessel for dropping in tonight. Well, it was a great pleasure, Bing, and I enjoy talking over the old times with you. By the way, who's with you next week? Got a grand parlay, Georgie. Bob Hope and Dorothy Lamour will be with me. My goodness. Well, that'll certainly give you a good rest, Bing. Why? With everybody looking at Lamour and Hope talking all the time, you can stay home and listen to the program with me, don't you? <laughs> <laughs> I think I'd better be on hand, Georgie, because I don't trust Hope with Lamour alone. <laughs> I really don't. Good night, George. Good night, folks. Good night, everybody. <laughs> this program is produced and transcribed in Hollywood by Bill Morrow and Murdo McKenzie. Lena Romai appears by arrangement with Metro Goldwyn Mayer, producers of the Technicolor picture till the clouds roll by, with an all star cast including Judy Garland and Frank Sinatra. Next week, Bob Hope and Dorothy Lamour will be Bing's guests. And remember, only Philco makes the 1201. It's the newest invention in radio from Philco, the leader. January 22nd, 1947, 77 years ago today, Philco Radio Time here on Classic Radio Theater with Wyatt Cox. We'll head for Pine Ridge, Arkansas, see what's going on with Lum and Abner, but first, these important messages. Alert today, alive tomorrow. Plan now with your family for civil defense emergency action. Someday it may save your lives. Join, work, and share together with others this knowledge of self-help. Civil defense, an American tradition. And if you want more information on civil defense uh, back in the 50s and 60s, and some of it could be relevant today, check it out at civildefensemuseum.com. Civildefensemuseum.com. Want to remind you tomorrow on Classic Radio Theater with Wyatt Cox, an episode of The Crime Club from Mutual, Inner Sanctum Mysteries, Dr. Christian, Dark Fantasy, and another episode of Lum and Abner, which reminds me, let's head to Pine Ridge, see what's going on with Lum and Abner now that Lum is in jail. 82 years ago, January 22nd, 1942. The makers of Alka-Seltzer bring you Lum and Abner. <laughs> just about one minute here before we switch you down to Pine Ridge, but what I'm going to tell you in that one minute can help you save yourself many hours of discomfort and misery. It's a fact, folks, if you'll just get acquainted with the prompt, pleasant relief that Alka-Seltzer offers in cold distress, you can save yourself many an unpleasant hour. Now, the thing to do when a cold strikes is to take the common sense precautions that your own good judgment tells you are wise. Start at once to get more rest than usual. Eat only light, easily digested foods. Dress warmly. Avoid drafts. Then, in addition, if you'll take Alka-Seltzer according to directions in the package, you can help yourself to a kind of relief that'll be most comforting. For Alka-Seltzer eases that dull, headachey, feverish feeling of a cold in a hurry. You'll want to use Alka-Seltzer as a gargle, too, for your raw, raspy, sore throat due to the cold. Well, my minute's almost up, so let me hasten on here to remind you that the time to try Alka-Seltzer is the minute you feel a cold coming on. And until you try it, you'll never know what a big difference Alka-Seltzer can make in the way you feel. Remember that name. It's Alka-Seltzer. Get it at any drugstore and take it for prompt, pleasant relief in cold distress. 
And now, let's see what's going on down in Pine Ridge. Well, the breach between the old fellows is wider than ever now. Squire Skimp talked Lum into breaking into the store the other night in order to get the paper back which gives Abner sole ownership of the store and bakery. The squire then turned about and traded this information to Abner for some groceries. So Abner called the town marshal, Uncle Henry Lunsford, and stationed him in the store that night to wait for Lum. As we look in on the little community today, we find poor old Lum in the town jail. And just outside the cell door, we find a very remorseful Abner. Listen. Well, now, listen, Lum. Go away. I don't want to talk to you, Mr. Peabody. You've got me throwed in jail. Ain't that enough to satisfy you? You have to come down here and gloat over what you've done? I don't want to gloat over nothing, Lum. I just want to explain to you how this whole thing was just a joke. A joke? It's a fine joke, making a jailbird out of a respectable citizen, putting a blot on an untarnished character, crossing his face with the shatter of the bars. Well, Lum, I never meant for you to actually get put in jail. When I told Uncle Henry Lunsford to surprise you at the store when you come in to get that paper you signed, why, well, I said I was just doing it to Josh you. Well, you ought to know better than to get Uncle Henry in on any kind of a joke. He don't know the meaning of the word joke. No. There's a seriousest one feller there is in this town. Special since he got to be town marshal. Granted, you ought to see how important he acts. I actually believe he's proud he's got me in here. Well, that's natural, Lom. You're the only prisoner he's ever had since he got elected, I reckon. Well, he's sure making the most of it, I know that. Granny, he bosses me around something wonderful. Bosses you around? Yeah, he's got a big bell he keeps ringing every time he wants me to do something. He rung it at 5 o'clock this morning, made me eat some bread and water. Said that was my breakfast. Well? And he rung it again at 6 and put a big chain on me and marched me outdoors to break up rocks. Break up rocks? Yeah, we finally found a rock, but we couldn't find nothing to break it up with, so he brought me back in. Well. Then he rung the bell again at 9 o'clock and gave me an encyclopedia to read. Said it was reading hour for the prisoners. Hmm. Huh. I didn't want to read nothing, but he held his gun on me and made me do it. Hey, doggy, where's Uncle Henry getting all them ideas? Oh, he's seen a moving picture in at the county seat all about a big penitentiary, so now he thinks he's got to do everything he's seen in that picture. Well, I do know. I ain't been here but a short time, and already I'm wore to a frazzle. Wore to a frazzle. Think what I'll be in ten years from now. Ten years? Why, you ain't gonna be in here ten years long. I don't know. I might just as well be. Everybody in town knows where I'm at, so I might just as well spend the rest of my life right here. I'm a ruined man. Don't matter now whether I'm here one day or a thousand years. Oh, you ain't ruined, Lom. I'll have you out of here today, just as soon as I can explain to Uncle Henry that I don't want to bring no charges again you for breaking in the store, he'll turn you loose. Go ahead, bring the charges again me. I don't care. No, sir, I ain't gonna do it. I'll get you out of here in no time at all. Well, why ain't you done it then? You've had enough time to explain all uh, Einstein's or whatever his name is theories about relatives by now. Well, I ain't been able to get a hold of Uncle Henry long enough to tell him nothing. He keeps saying he's too busy to talk to me. Yeah, it sounds like him. Just keeps running around like he's might not text. I reckon he's just so excited about having my prisoner he don't know what to do. Well, it don't matter no way, because I don't want you to get me out of here. Fact is, I don't never want to have nothing to do with you as long as I live, Mr. Peabody. Oh, now, listen to me, Lom. I mean it, I mean every word I'm saying. Why, Lom, me and you've been partners for a long time, and... Uh-oh. Togus, what's that? Oh, that's that dead blame bell Uncle Henry keeps ringing. Hmm. What's it ringing for this time? I don't know. More than likely wants me to scrub out the jail again or some such crazy idea. Well, I'll find out in a minute. Here he comes. Yeah, well, good. I'll get a chance to talk to him. All right, all right. All right. All the prisoners get ready for recreation hour. Oh, hello there, Abner. Yeah, hello, Uncle Henry. Say, I want to talk to you. Yes, all right. Ain't got time to talk now, Abner. Have to take care of the prisoners right now. Got them on strict regulation. Only way to run a jail is to run it right. Let's see now. Which is the right key? Well, Uncle Henry, yeah, this is important. Oh, here we are. 
Well, how are you, Lum? Or I mean number 6702. I ain't very good, Uncle Henry. Uh-uh. The prisoners all call me Marshal. I mean Marshal. What are you unlocking my cell for? Recreation hour for the prisoners. A rigid system of exercise. Builds up the prisoner's body and gets his mind off of crime and all such as that. All right, all right. Step out of your cell. But I don't want no exercise, Marshal. Oh, yes, you do. Yes, sir, Reva. Regulation says you do. All right, now. All prisoners, line up and count off. Count off? I'm the only prisoner you got. I said count off. Oh, all right. One. That's fine. All prisoners present, you're counted for. Say, Uncle Henry, now I gotta talk to you. Don't interfere with jail regulations, Abner. All right, number 7602. Hands on the hips. Up on the toes, the count of one. Bend at the knees and back into position. Uncle Henry, I don't need no exercise. There we go. One, two, three, four. One, now two, Now listen, Uncle three, Henry, four. you can't put Lom in jail. One, two, three, four. I don't want to bring no One, charges two, against him. three, four. Uncle Henry, now listen One, to me. One, two, three, four. The other night when I wanted One, you to catch Lom breaking in the three, store, I never four. meant that you ought to actually One. throw him in jail. All right, all right, that's all for recreation hour. Back in your cell. Uncle Henry, now you got to listen to me. Come, come, come. Back in your cell. Well, now, wait a minute. This is important. In you go. In you go. There. Hey, wait a minute. Wait a minute. You got me in a cell. I ain't the one that's in jail. Huh? What's that? Let me out of here. Yeah, for goodness sakes, get him out of there. I don't want to have to share no cell with him. Oh, oh, I'm sorry, Abner. Bending over that way in them exercises gets me a little dizzy and my eyes blur. Here, I'll get you out. Yeah, okay. hurry up. That's too strenuous. Might have to cut out this recreation hour. Any as I hope so. I can't put up with this much longer. All right, all right. In you go, Lum. Or, I mean, number 7620 or 6... Let's see, what was your number now, Lum? I don't know, and I don't care. By George, I'd better go and look that up. If you're going to run a jail, you might as well run it right. That's what I always say if you're going to run Well, hey, jail. Uncle Henry, wait a minute. Come back here. Uncle Henry. Stop hollering. He won't come back. No, I reckon not. Oh, wait a minute. Wait a minute. Look. Look What's here. <laughs> Look here. Uncle Henry left the keys in the lock here. <laughs> Hi, right, doggy. This is your chance, Lum. Come on. Come on. I'll let you out right now. I don't want to get out. Don't want to get out? Of course not. What have I got to get out for? Huh? There ain't no place for a ruined man with a shatter of bars on him. Nobody will harm me, and I ain't got no store or bakery or nothing to go back to. Yes, you have too, long. No, I ain't. That all belongs to you, Mr. Peabody. No, 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 not no more, it don't. <laughs> I, I, I'm going to give you your half back, Lum. Just give it right back to you, and me and you'll be partners. All right, doggies, I got you in jail, and I'm going to get you out. I wish now that Squire Skimp never had a told me you was going to break in the store and get that paper. Squire? Yeah? Did he tell you that? Why, of course he did. I don't know how he found out you was going to do it, but over there at the store the other day, why, he said he'd found it out that he'd done some sort of detective work, he said. Why, that snake in the weeds. He was the one that talked me into doing it. Squire was? Yes, sir. He said how you and me had always been such good partners, a beautiful friendships and all such as that. And he said the one thing that was keeping us apart was that little scrap of paper I signed giving you the store and bakery. So it was my duty to get it back. Well, I do That's know. That's what he said. Well, I wondered how he knew exactly what time you was going to break in and all. Snake in the weeds. Abner, I've changed my mind. I want to get out of here. You do? I got to have a little talk with Squire Kim. <laughs> That's our time. Wait a minute. Here, I'll unlock the door for you no, right now. No, I don't mean get out that way. I don't want to be no fugitive from justice. Oh. Uh-huh. Go to Uncle Henry and tell him that about you not bringing charges again, me, and I know he'll let me out. Yeah, yeah, I dog is. I'll make him listen this time. Tell him that you... Uh-oh. You won't need to go. He'll be here in a minute. He rings the bell, and then he runs in here. Well, reckon what is for this time. I don't know, but whatever it is, I ain't going to do it. I know all that. right, all right. All prisoners' attention. What is it now, Marshal? It's the, uh, 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 let me see now. It's, uh, 
Dead gummit, I forgot what I rung the bell for this time. Let me see now. Well, don't bother thinking it up, Uncle Henry, because Lum ain't going to be in jail no longer, no way. Huh? What do you mean by that? Well, in the first place, Lum never actually took nothing when he come in the store the other night. Of course he didn't. I never gave him a chance. And in the second place, it was all just a joke. I ain't going to bring charges again in no way, so you might as well let him out. Let him out? Yeah, didn't you hear me say I weren't going to bring charges again? Abner, this is clean out of your hands. The law is taken over. Lum here has broke into a store building, so it's my duty to lock him up. I've got to show the citizens of this town that all breaking of the law has got to be punished. Number 6702 here has committed a crime. And by George, he's got to stand trial for it. Stand trial? Yes, sir. This is the first prisoner I've had in this jail since I've been in office. And by cracky, I aim to make an example out of it. Well... It looks like Uncle Henry's authority might have to be put to the test in court, doesn't it? And say, folks, have you ever put Alka-Seltzer to the test? Well, if you have, if you've ever taken Alka-Seltzer when acid indigestion or some minor stomach upset was really making your life miserable, I'm sure you've discovered that here's a friend that can be depended upon in time of need. For when you take Alka-Seltzer for acid indigestion, sour stomach, or excess gastric acidity, you'll feel better fast. Try it and see for yourself why thousands of folks from coast to coast depend on Alka-Seltzer for the kind of relief they want in a hurry. Get it at any drugstore by the package or the glass. And remember, the large size package of Alka-Seltzer is more economical because you get three times the number of tablets for only twice the price of the smaller size. <laughs> Making an example of Lum, oy vey. Tomorrow on Classic, oh, that, by the way, was Lum and Abner 82 years ago, January 22nd, 1942. Uh, have a great Monday. Tomorrow on our Tuesday edition, The Crime Club, Inner Sanctum Mysteries, Dr. Christian, Dark Fantasy, and another episode of Lum and Abner. Have yourself a great day. We will see you on Tuesday for more Classic Radio Theater with Wyatt Cox.